long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a Duke Media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series. My name is Scott Daly, and I am currently fleeing across the desert. My name is Matt Freeman, and I'm following him. That's right, Matt. Stick close behind because it's going to be a wild ride. The journey has officially begun and I am so very excited and a little bit nervous. This is a this is a big day for us. Uh, we've been planning the show for a while and it's here and we're doing it now. And that's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's got that new show smell in here. <laughs> exactly. Today, we're going to be discussing chapter one of book one of the Dark Tower, which both happen to be titled The Gunslinger. Cool. Yeah. So for those of you joining us here at Doof Media for the very first time and also skipped our brief introduction episode, uh, very, very bad. Yes. Uh, Scott and I are co-owners of a media network that creates podcasts all about the stories that we love. You can check uh, us out, um, all the shows we do over at doofmedia.com and follow us over on our Twitter at, uh, at Doof Media. Yeah, and this particular show, as you said before, will see me, a Stephen King obsessive and constant reader, lead Matt, a King Virgin, through this book, this eight book series. Which Scott has read many times. Yeah, and Matt has never, ever, ever read it. Yeah, so this uh, this podcast is for both new and old readers alike. Indeed. Uh, and now let's stop with this prescripted nonsense, Matt, and let's talk about the book. Let's talk about chapter one of book one of the series, The Gunslinger in The Gunslinger. Uh, in this chapter, we meet Roland, the the gunslinger who is fleeing across the desert to chase the mysterious man in black. And then we kind of do this little flashback thing where we learn uh, this big, important event in the past couple months of this chase in, the, in a small town called Tull and uh, some bad things that happened there. So, Matt, what did you think? We've started now. What did you think of chapter one of book one of The Dark Tower? Well, I, I loved it, which is a good sign for this yes, as, a, as a show. Um, and, and what's interesting is uh, the, the thing that stood out to me most. So, again, I've only read Needful Things and Carrie, which are both good books that I enjoyed. But there was something about just how this was written that just struck me as just very measured and precise at the level of like sentences and paragraphs yeah. and tone and what it's what it's aiming for was just really, really hit me really hard, um, harder than I was expecting. Like, like I know I, I have plenty of respect for King, um, but I think this was still better than I was expecting it to be. That's awesome. That's really exciting. Uh, one of the things I was really taken aback by this this read through was just like the the dourness of this world like this is like especially in this first chapter, everything's bad. Right. The, the term in this it's basically this post-apocalypse type thing, right? But the term in this book is the world has moved on mm -hmm. is what how King describes it. And like nothing's like even at the end, we, we see our character go through all these events and we do this kind of nested storytelling structure that we're going to really talk about as we go through the chapter. But everything's bleak. Everything's bad. Um, we don't even understand our character's motivation yet. King keeps we, we know Roland's chasing this guy. And we learn a little bit about who this guy is. We learn a little bit about who Roland is. We don't know why he's doing it. We don't know what his motivation is. We don't understand any of this stuff yet. We're just kind of living in this little vignette of one of the towns he comes across as he's chasing this guy and how awful it all goes. Yeah, I mean, the character is is drawn so sparely that we don't even get his name for tens of pages. And, yeah. and we may not even realize that that's the case because... Really, King's leaning really hard on these tropes of the lone, the lone gunslinger, the samurai, um, the guy who walks into town, the man with no name. And, yeah. and and what's interesting, and I think we'll talk about this as we go through this chapter, that King really plays with um, both sticking to that archetype really strongly and then violating your expectations and, and maybe going a little bit away from it in, in small ways that make you very curious about who this guy really is under the surface. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I, I look forward to that conversation, especially as we move into the later chapters of this book. I think it, it no spoilers for you, but it will we will learn quite a bit more about him before this book is through. Um, and it really kind of expands upon the stuff that King does in this early story to to explain and kind of set up these characters. Cool. So let's go ahead and just jump right into it and let's get into the specific discussion of this chapter. And I know I just said that, but before we begin, I want to set the stage a little bit because I think The Gunslinger itself is kind of an unusual book 
uh, at least in this series, because because it, it actually wasn't even an originally a book, but it was rather a series of five short stories published in the, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction between the years of 1978 and 1981. These five stories eventually became the five chapters of this book, when which King compiled and released collectively in 1982. Um, this is why I think some of the chapters, first of all, Stephen King does pretty lengthy chapters generally. Um, but I think this book especially has some pretty long chapters. I think some of our, our listeners, when we were kind of starting this whole thing, were questioning like, Hey, the, the chapter is only like eight minutes long. And we're like, no, no, no. That's like a section of the first chapter. The first chapter is like 70 something pages. And that's really what it was is just, it was a short story. And then he had to edit it kind of together, uh, to make this book. Um, the book was later revised after King completed the entire Dark Tower series in 2003 to correct some of the inconsistencies in his world and better lay some seeds towards where the series would eventually go. Uh, he didn't even consider this retconning. He he just thinks of the Dark Tower as kind of one story that he published serially, and the revisions were just like a normal part of the editing process that any author would do. Um, and, and just a note for everyone out there listening, we are going to be reading the revised edition as it's A, the one that King wants us to read, and B the only one that's available in print these days. You can find the old one used, but the the revised edition is the only one you can go to a bookstore and buy right now. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, it, it just uh, he wasn't quite done editing it when it came out due to the vagaries of fate. And uh, yeah, now this is the final version. And, it, and I do think it is fair to say that who Stephen King as a person changed rather dramatically between 1982 and 2003. And um, I think that the the story shifted to go along with the changes at, of who he was as a person. And that's one of the reasons I love this book uh, and the series is it is a way of kind of examining who Stephen King is as a storyteller and kind of and, and as a as a human being. And like this book reflects the changing nature of his life over the course of it, because it went through so much of it. He wrote these first uh, three or four books you know, semi early in his career and then took a very, very long break and then just knocked out the last three in the series very quickly at the end of that. So it is this kind of like like catalog of who Stephen King is. Yeah, I hope that you'll inject your insight into stuff like that as we go along, because I'm going to continue to be curious about like where was he in his life when when he was writing, you know, whatever it is that we're reading at the time. Yeah, I absolutely will. Sure. It is interesting. I think a surprising number of, of good, famous books start out serialized. I think Foundation started this way. Um, I know that Ender's Game began as a much shorter um, story published in a magazine. It, 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 it was not necessarily serialized, but it started out as a, yeah. a smaller kernel. And I, I kind of like I kind of like this. Like, I, I think the creator ends up spending a lot more time on each piece of the story um, when it's published serially. And then it ends up with a really solid final product when they put them all together. Yeah, I agree. I, I, and I think, I think it's pro it probably happens a lot because I think a lot of our authors, um, start just writing short fiction to try to get published in magazines. Mm -hmm. And that's like before they land their big first novel deal, that's what they're doing a lot of. And a lot of authors are very attached to those pieces. I mean, that's Stephen King was very attached to these stories and that's why he wanted to build something off of them. I think th there's an introduction in this book that I specifically told you not to read because it's very spoilery, but in it, he talks about how he was obsessed with the Lord of the Rings as a kid, as a lot of, uh, a lot of kids were, and he kind of always envisioned making his own version of that story. Um, and, and that's, this is what that eventually became. And it, so it's, I look at dark, uh, I look at the dark tower as this Lord of the Rings, but in through the Stephen King lens, which is a very crazy lens. Well, that's awesome. Cause I think you and I both love Lord of the Rings. So yeah. 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 All right, so that history lesson aside, let's begin with the first words of the story, which are famously, the man in back black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. The gunslinger, whose name we learn, as you said, much, much later, like 60 pages later, uh, is crossing this massive hard pan desert. The book describes it as the apotheosis of desert, chasing this mysterious man in black who we don't see also for pages and pages. Yeah, so we always like to focus on opening lines, opening pages when we discuss books. Mm -hmm. So the, to me, this first line feels like it's manifesting this perfectly stripped down archetype announcing what kind of story this is going to be. The yeah. man in black is a bad guy. <laughs> got, got it. The good guy is pursuing him. The setting is a desert, which is a hostile and unforgiving environment. 
the conflict and the principal players and the tone are all already established in this first sentence and then reinforced from here. Yeah, I, I love that. You're right. It is it is brilliant in its simplicity that it's just you get everything you need to. And there's something I mean, I think King mentioned that this he had the sentence in his mind for a very, very long time before he actually started writing this particular story. Um, and it's just because it's just evocative. It really is. Yeah. Um, and and I like I love the difference, like the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed like there is he Roland is chasing this man, but even in these opening lines, he's not like speed walking. He's not racing. He's just like a, a slow measured plod that is a, like slowly but surely catching up to the guy he's chasing. Yeah. It, and it's interesting, right? Because it's almost like um, normally I would say like you don't want to make your protagonist seem like their victory is inevitable. <laughs> Yeah, like sure. like you want you want to actually make your protagonist seem weak and like they're not going to be able to succeed. You're going you're supposed to be thinking, man, how are they going to how is he going to catch this guy? And he actually makes Roland seem like such a badass that and, and Roland himself seems so confident um, mm -hmm. that you're that like I, I finish this chapter feeling like, oh, he's going to catch him, uh, <laughs> um, which which is just interesting at this point. I don't really have anything more to say about that. It's It's just a. A, a, an unusual choice i would say it's especially for fantasy novels or fantasy series is usually you start sure. out with kind of a weak a weak protagonist to become stronger um this guy's already really strong i have a theory that we might be f spending a lot of the book flashing back to weaker versions of this character but uh, okay. we'll, we'll get to talking about that yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do spend a lot of the first few pages of the book describing Roland in detail as he continues his trek. There's this beautiful moment where he's got this weird, like, I think the book describes it as like a yawing sensation where like this dizziness that he feels. Mm -hmm. And then he just kind of shrugs it off and moves on from it. I, I like that a lot because he like at several times in the early part of this book, he will question what that was. And then he'll just be like, I don't know the answer to this question. I'm just going to put it aside and just keep on walking. And that, I think that is really character defining as well, where like there's this mystery. He's like, what is that about? What's going Why did I feel that way? Why did it remind me of this time in my past? Um, and then he's just like, oh, well, don't know what to do with that. Put it aside. Yeah. Yeah. It just it's it sets our expectations for how this guy is going to think and behave where yeah. he, when, when something comes up, he kind of refuses to let it bother him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he's walking stolidly with this full water bag. Um, King drops some familiar names at us, hinting about a, a religious group. He's calling the Manny who worship the man Jesus, um, which is just like I, I think that's just a fun twist on like it would be so different from just saying Jesus. Right. Like yeah. the man Jesus is recognizable, but otherworldly at the same time. And I think this is King trying to orient us in this world. Like, like this is, this is our world because there's Jesus, but it's not because it's different. Like, and I, I love how he does that and continues to do it throughout uh, this chapter. Yeah. There's really only a, a couple of, of like proper noun uh, drops like this and, and Hey Jude, where you're like, okay, that's weird. That's anachronistic. Yeah. I, th something weird is going on. I don't, I, and, and the thing is, like, he doesn't really help you understand what um, at this point. I think it's just how it's just making you feel really disoriented and and curious mainly. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think to me, um, I, I think that we're supposed to be wondering what exactly this moved on phrase really means. Like, sure. We're not meant to assume that people have simply immigrated due to desertification or something mundane like that. Like there's, there's clearly fantasy elements in play here. Um, but beyond that, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that because it's, it's not as if it's not describing the people as moved on. It is the earth. It is the place. The world has moved on, um, which is, is something different and, and evocative. I agree with that. Like, and it's, it's a phrase that is repeated multiple times yeah. throughout this chapter, um, really trying to get us to understand that. And I mean, one of the things that we'll see throughout this book is King uses a lot of different kind of language in the story. There's like it's not full on like he didn't write Elvish like Tolkien did, but like the way the people in this world talk is slightly askew of our own and there's terms and stuff that we don't find from that familiar. And this is, I think one of them, but I think even the ones we don't find familiar may be rooted in things that we're supposed to be able to decode. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, moved on colloquial means that they died. Like you say, sure, Oh, he, sure. he, or we say passed on, I guess is really what we say, but, mm -hmm. but, but, but I, 
it's close enough to passed on that it makes me think, oh, the world, the world died. OK. Yeah. And I think yeah. the tech supports that, too, because like we see everyone talking about like uh, there's nothing here anymore. Like we start there's no other people. I think he describes it. it's just him and the man in black. Nobody else. Nobody mm-hmm. else. Um, so I think that it does support that read. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by far, the most detailed description we get, though, is of the gunslinger's guns, which makes sense. Yeah. And the text says below the water bag were his guns carefully weighted to his hands. A plate had been added to each where they had come to him from his father, who had been lighter and not so tall. The two belts crisscrossed above his crotch. The holsters were oiled too deeply for even this Philistine son to crack. The stocks of the gun were sandalwood, yellow and finely grained. Rawhide tie downs held to holsters loosely to his thighs, and they swung a bit with his step. They had almost rubbed away the bluing of his jeans in a pair of arcs that looked almost like smiles. The brass casings of the cartridge looped in the gun belts, heliographed in the sun. There were fewer now. The leather made subtle creaking noises. I, I just love like it. it Of course, it makes perfect sense that King spends a lot of time describing these guns because these are to Roland's own admission, the some of, if not the most important things in the world to him. Yeah, it's this really beautiful, l- lengthy description. You know, we, we've spent paragraphs on this much more than anything else up to this point in the text. And we've got these long rhythmic sentences that just sound gorgeous to hear read aloud. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't help it, but um, note the presence of parentheses in, in this text, mm-hmm. where it's... Um, you know, parentheses are, are fairly unusual in fiction, uh, I would say. Yeah. But King uses them many times in chapter one. And parentheses just kind of automatically remind me of the repeatedly nested flashbacks that we're about to be treated to. Yeah, I like that a lot. King it, King likes to use parentheses a lot. Um, I don't know if you remember when we read Carrie, how he used parentheses to kind of interject with characters, internal thoughts, like in the middle of dialogue. Um, he used that in that book a whole, whole lot. And he does that, especially through his early works a lot. He likes he really likes parentheses. Um, and so I don't think it's I don't think it's a surprise to me that you notice that at all. Yeah. And, and that was I was kind of going to say, actually, like, I don't know if maybe he, this is just a, a thing that he likes. But 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 in any case, like regardless, when you think of parentheses, you think of like, I'm going to throw you in a side, like a, a callback to something else. And yeah. in a certain sense, this chapter is a series of nested parentheses of nested stories so yeah yeah no i i think it is something he likes but i think like all great authors i think he uses the things he likes to uh reflect on his stories in interesting ways and i think i think you're right there i think that feeling you got is intentional Mm -hmm. because you're absolutely right this is it's a parenthetical in a parenthetical in a parenthetical Uh right (laughs) yeah um what i just like there's there's a lot in here, right? There's a lot in these two paragraphs. Like we learn that these guns belong to his father. Um, I think a little bit later we, we learn how important they are to him just through his description. But then later he says when he's thinking about he, how he's lost his hat, he's lost his horn uh, and he's lost all his friends. And, but he kind of tries to reassure himself with these guns. I still have these guns and they're the most important thing, aren't they? And I love that, that the text almost asks us the question, Mm -hmm. which really cues us into his own doubt about this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. These little tiny nuggets that are, that are making us think like, okay, this, this guy, he's struggling with something, but he's so self-assured and cool that the the way we're going to see the struggle is only through these tiny little cracks like like that yeah um, yeah which is which is really fun i think i mean it it encourages you to pay a lot of attention when you have a character who is intentionally i mean it's almost an unreliable narrator sort of situation where you know you know that, that there's stuff going on with him and he is almost in denial or or, or at <laughs> least not not willing to think about it directly yeah uh, like later he's clearly bothered by the fact that he had to massacre this town and um uh, almost can't admit that it bothers him or, or is almost in sure. denial that it bothers him and but it but it definitely does like that's, that's just an example of this kind of thing yeah yeah and i think one of the things that is interesting here is like 
normally I think if you had a character who in the first couple pages of your book is like constantly introspective and thinking about the past, you're establishing him as a character that is just an introspective guy thinking about the past. But what King does here is make Roland kind of confused and surprised as to the fact that he's thinking about this stuff so mm-hmm. much, which I think draws more attention to it. Like this is not normal behavior for him because he's almost weirded out by the fact that it's happening as well. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. Yeah. All right. So Roland, as he's walking, comes up by upon a campfire left by the man in black. This is uh, the only sign he gets that his query is still ahead of him. Um, But he knows somehow in his gut that he is gaining. Uh, He does think again about that detached and dizzy feeling he had before and how it made him think of his friends. But like we said, since he can't do anything with that, he just sets it aside and he makes a fire. And this is another thing that I think King does very well visually is is kind of um, like build the world by showing how he does make this fire because he says these words he says spark a dark where's my sire will i lay me will i stay me bless this camp with fire um and then has roland kind of comment about how these are like a children's game um and and some of those words stick with you and some of those are left behind and and he almost doesn't believe any of this like he doesn't believe that it's like actual powerful words because he the text calls them old and powerful nonsense words which Mm -hmm. is a great juxtaposition there yeah right i i kind of stuck on that too where i was like okay is he doing magic or is it literally just a a a rhyme that he happens to know and 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 i don't think he knows either necessarily i mean i think that's really a a cool idea um yeah yeah my take was always that it's just a rhyme but i i I like that i like you felt that unknown there i like Mm -hmm. that a lot yeah yeah so it seems to me like this is a character who's going to be struggling with this burden of memory and, and regret. Um, I, interestingly, even after having finished this whole chapter, I really have no idea how old he he is. Um, <laughs> if anything, I'm more confused by the end of chapter one um, as there's like a character later on who remembers him as a boy. And yet Roland seems to be he seems to at least behave like a grizzled old man. Um, it talks about like the ruins of his face, but you're like, okay, well, it could just be his face is messed up because he's been walking in the desert for a long time. And sure. so, so it's just really interesting how he, he seems to carry this burden of memory and regret, but I actually don't know how old he is. Yeah. Well, you got to remember time moves funny out here, man. Mm-hmm. They say that a few times They do. when, it's, when it's like, when, how long has it been? How far ahead of me is he? When was he last year? Uh, it could be two months or six yeah <laughs> like that's a big it's a big range yeah um, yeah yeah i think that's fair i think i think it's fair to say you're supposed to be wondering that without mm-hmm. saying too much yeah. okay Uh, So let's talk about Roland for a bit, a man that appreciates the feeling of being thirsty, that appreciates the irony of making this campfire and saying these words, a man who lays his fuel to make the campfire, not in an artful way like the man in black he chases, but in just a very workable, functional way, Uh, a person who sees black and white. And this is like one of my favorite lines in the entire chapter. Um, It it spoke of a man who might straighten bad pictures in strange hotel rooms. Um, And I think that's like the best description of a person ever ever yeah. that's that strikes me as being very king somehow even though i haven't yeah. read that much of him I, I i love that line i adore that it, like this is a guy who will see that things are done right and proper even if nobody's watching um it, it's just especially in the context in which it's used it's it's so you know strong yeah. um right you know, and, and yeah i think right and, and done proper and like the 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 bad picture in a strange hotel room right so it's not like he's seeing beautiful artwork on the wall that is uh that is not straight it's a bad picture like it's not a good picture and it's not his room so like it's nothing that belongs to him it's not even good it's just a person that that wants order that wants right and wrong and is going to behave that way regardless it's it's such a great line yeah yeah I, i like that um, so now, you know, we're, we're at the end of like 1.1. Um, sure. So I, I don't know. I don't know what nomenclature to use, but this is the end of section one of chapter one. Uh, and I wanted to just remark that all that happens in 1.1 is basically <laughs> our characters walking, stops walking because he discovers sign of his quarry. He makes the fire. Um, but it's like the thousand little details of character and execution that, that make this brilliant and just riveting. Um, like, like, what does it say that he makes his fire right on top of the remains of the man in black's fire? Like that, like all these little, all these little tiny things like that are, are what make up the substance of the chapter for me. 
Yeah. And, and to me, that is Stephen King like that. That is quintessentially Stephen King. The plot is just a tool to him um, to explore character. And th- those are my favorite books, like throughout this whole chapter, not just one dot one. What happens? I mean, we literally end the chapter right where we started it mm-hmm. with him sitting around this campfire because everything's a flashback. But the flashbacks are just like he goes to this town. He spends a few days there banging this chick <laughs> and then he kills everyone and moves on. Like that's that's all the plot that really happens in this. But you're right. It is so it is so layered, so important. There's so much detail and character work going on in the middle of this plot. Um, and that is that is Stephen King to me. And that is why I love him so much. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and, I, and I like that you pulled like I think I think there's a lot in the way he behaves and the way in which he and the man in black uh, mirror each other in interesting ways. And I think like the the building a fire on top of his fire, um, he even like eats a bit of his burnt jerky. Um, like there is there is the sense of of mirroring him and following him, but repeating him mm-hmm. in in really interesting ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I I kind of had my own impression of the meaning of that, but I feel like it's not fully developed. So I'm looking sure. forward to see how that how that goes yeah. on. So as Roland sits around the fire, he eventually sleeps and dreams and we flash back to a time uh, some amount of time ago. We're not exactly sure. Uh, Roland and he has a mule now. He's got a a mule and it's a long suffering mule have come out of the foothills and they're into the desert proper. And he comes upon what is described as basically probably the last settlement he sees before he really gets into the desert proper. And there is this farmer named Brown growing corn and they have they basically interact. And this part of this chapter is just an interaction between them. And I I love this opening map because the first question that Brown asks Roland is, is the alive or dead? And I love how King uses questions like this to really emphasize the otherworldly nature of this setting we're in. This question is asked and answered as if it weren't a fucking weird ass thing to ask someone. Yeah. Like, it's a really strange thing to ask a person. Are you alive or dead? Obviously, I'm alive. I'm standing in front of you. But in a world of devil grass and and tahine, which are we see like as he's walking, he sees a, a person with a bird head. Yeah. And he describes it as the tahine. Um, so in a world with these things. That question is not strange. Yeah, I, I like there's there's even some ambiguity as to like, OK, well, that's one kind of tahin. Maybe there's other kinds of tahin. I don't, right. I don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, like th- this is <laughs> this is later on. But the this mule, it's like this is just kind of a, a dying old mule at first. Mm-hmm. And then later you realize like, oh, this is like the last mule in the world that isn't some kind of a horrible <laughs> mutant. <laughs> right. And, and just like the way they talk about like, it's like, Oh, it's so weird that he has a, a mule with four legs. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm officially freaked out by this world now. Um, <laughs> right. Right. Th- threaded stock. We see that with, when he buys the, the burgers in town as well, where it's yeah. threaded stock and he's wondering how many legs did this thing I'm eating have? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't even I, I, like what's great is I what's great is I don't know what that means, but I know that it I know that it basically means you're eating some kind of mutant thing. And mm-hmm. th- that's all I need to know to make it disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the uh, the people in this story talk a great deal about life and death, um, like like more than normal. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the idea that a guy gave him a compass and told him to give it to Jesus. Uh, sorry, the man, Jesus. Um, that's just one of those things where you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> where, where are we going with all this? Yeah. I mean, it just, it, it's just kind of thrown in there as like, all right, I guess the compass is going to be a thing now and it seems important. And, uh, I don't know. It's just one of those things where you're just so curious now. Um, well, yeah. And I love what, what the, the book's response to this is Roland being like, yeah, I mean, I'll give it to him if I see him. Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen, but you never know. Right. <laughs> and it's like, it's just, he's so matter of fact and, and just like, just monotone with that kind of stuff like that this is jesus like yeah. presumably and as we learn more in, in this chapter in particular it is jesus from the at least a kind of christian version a version of the of christianity yeah um because we have the the preacher woman in the end that is basically reciting old testament characters yeah. so um we're relatively confident that this is christianity on some point and he's just like super cash about yeah maybe maybe i'll run into jesus i don't know yeah it makes me want to like hand a stranger on the street a, a really nice compass and tell them to give it to Jesus and then just walk yeah. away just to give we them should, that experience in their life. We should just start doing that. Yeah. 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 Just make, make the world a little bit more surreal for everyone. Mm. 
Uh, also interesting how we start establishing this devil grass substance as, as this kind of evil drug um, pretty early on in the story. Um, and then it goes on to be actually plot relevant later. But yeah, I think that's like a very cool world building concept that the only thing that will willingly grow in this environment is this toxic, addictive drug. Yeah. And, and I like there's this kind of this ominous moment at the very beginning of the book where he's sleeping in front of that fire and the wind changes direction and blows some of the smoke and he inhales it. And you're kind of led to believe that perhaps this flashback we're seeing right now is like a result of breathing in some of this devil grass because mm-hmm. he's burning it for his fire. Um, th- there's nothing like the book never specifically spells that out, but it seems like that that could be the case because it does say his dreams are troubling and, and it does the, the devil grass is specific at least supposed to screw with your dreams a little bit. Yeah, so. that, was, that was my assumption as well. Yeah. So then we have this moment where they're kind of, him and Brown are kind of introducing themselves to each other. And they go through this like very specific language here uh, that is the same language that you and I have used to start and end of the show. He says, life for your crop, life for your own. And then long days and pleasant nights, stranger. And may you have twice the number. And this is something we're going to see several times. This long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number as it's just like the normal acceptable greeting in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And I kind of want to just use this to briefly talk to you about language. We've already kind of talked about this a bit, but the specific language of the Dark Tower is something that King does very interestingly. And I'd like you going forward to like pick out because I I was kind of trying to like, should I do like a glossary of like, like we do a glossary section where we talk about the language and the words, but I don't, that would be tough for me because like be like, well, I know what this means, but we're not supposed to know yet. So I think going forward, if you're reading and you see like a, a, a phrase or a word that jumps out at you as something different and like dark tower languagey, you just like pull that out and we can talk about them. Cause I, I think they're very interesting in, in the way they kind of do a lot of work to establish the world. Yeah, that sounds fun. Um, I mean, th- this one in particular is interesting because, and I, this isn't really a fully formed thought, but it's like, it, it's kind of strange just to, to, uh, it's not strange to offer some, that to offer someone a wish of good fortune, for example, but sure. to, re- to return it back and say, may you have twice as much, may you have twice as, may you live twice as long as I, mm-hmm. that's actually unusual, I would say. Um, and it gives you a certain feeling about how these people think about their world and their, and their lives. Um, hard to articulate yeah. exactly what what i would say it means other than um yeah it, it feels weird to to, to like to someone say like yeah you know, have a good day and you say like you have twice as good a day yeah you, know? you have a you have a much better day than me sir right yeah, y- yeah yes I, th- th- I think i think that's the crux of it basically what you just said like the idea of like i, I wish you better than i will ever have so, mm-hmm. sort of it, which, it, i don't know it's an interesting psychology thing yeah. And Brown's response here is basically like, doubt it. <laughs> like, yeah, he's he's like he's this guy who's been living out. He can't even remember how long he's been living out here. He's been alone. The only other human being he sees is the guy that comes and sells him beans every so often. And he's got his his crow Zoltan. And that's all he sees, except for these two travelers that have walked by him in the past few months. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's just kind of living out here doing his thing. And so yeah. he's not exactly an optimistic fellow. Yeah, a really interesting character. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other things this does really, really interestingly is we have an interaction later in this chapter where Roland does the same thing to someone. He says long days and pleasant nights and he does not get that response. And because this has been established as like the norm, it allows that interaction to kind of ping weirdly to you right because i think i think it's when he gets to the the livery and in tull and and gives that interaction and kid just ignores him he just doesn't say anything to him and it's like it's like that is you you already know that that's uncouth and nothing in the book told you that it's just by seeing it seeing it in this interaction and seeing it in that interaction it just comes across yeah absolutely that it makes you uncomfortable Mm -hmm. everything until it makes you uncomfortable then yes yes very true very true all right so roland here admits that he came from a place he calls in world uh, in which there may or may not be anything left uh the man in black who we also learn is a sorcerer is about six weeks possibly two as many as six weeks ahead of roland um and then of course we see the gunslinger is not entirely sure if he can trust the word of brown um there is a little bit of uh assumption that this could be a trick of the man in black 
Yeah. Um, the whole thing with Brown, I, I found fascinating. Brown reminds me more than a little bit of Tom Bombadil, um, like in the best possible way. Oh, that's interesting. Because he's this mysterious helper who knows too much. And he seems just kind of like purely good, almost to the point where uh, Roland just can't believe he's legit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the like the 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 idea that he, that Roland has to deal with sorcery so often that he's like seriously considering like he could just be a hallucination and maybe I should just kill him. I, I think mm-hmm. is just a a really interesting place to take this. Yeah, and I think later in the book it says something like he he's seriously considering him just so he'll be able to sleep with both eyes shut. Yeah, and that I mean that goes a long way to characterizing Roland, but also just showing like the uncertainty of this world. Right. I think I think the cool thing about that is that Roland considers it, but then doesn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But of course, through Roland's entire action with Brown, we have his raven keep repeating this line, screw you and the horse you rode in on, which is a specific anachronism, but also really like ten- like brings tension to the scene. Um, mm-hmm. He also does beans, beans. They're good for your heart. The more you eat them, the more you fart, which yeah. is another weird anachronism in here. Um, but but I think the raven like like yelling at Roland really ups the tension because like, like we just said, he's not sure if he can trust this guy. Um, I think later he's specifically Brown specifically says, have you decided whether I'm an enchantment or, lo- or not yet? Um, and the, just the, the presence of this bird really helps sell that. I think there's a point where he goes over to the well and suddenly the bird is behind him and he's like, is this bird going to push me in? Is this bird mm. gonna push, or is Brown going to sneak up behind me and push me in the well? Um, and yeah, it's just like, it's, it's crazy how paranoid he is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but it makes sense. Like, and it gives you a sense of the, of what the situation, it it gives you a sense of the danger that he's been facing and and will be facing going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, I I just love the exchange of, of, you'll never catch him. I'll catch him. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's one of my favorite. And like, you know, there's no, he said there's, it's just, it's kind of iconic in the same way as like the first line was where yeah. I, I just read that in Roland's voice as just being utterly confident and, and with, with no doubt. Um, yeah. Like there, it's not, it's not as if it's not a line that Roland is trying to convince someone else or himself. It is just certainty. Mm-hmm. Like it is, it is as like, like there's a line here, like I'll have water if God wills it. And this is, this is almost as if, like God has willed this, like this is going to happen. I am, there's no doubt it is, it is certain. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's really great. It's like, it's like a monster in a monster movie pursuing its prey and, yeah. and it has no, it, it's not walking fast, but it's going to catch them. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, on that note, I kind of want to talk about what a badass Roland is portrayed as being without really overdoing it. Like we're, again, we're hitting all the right notes of the gunslinger trope while still keeping uh, what can be a very stale and blank ar- archetype, fresh and mysterious and interesting with these little wrinkles. Yeah, I totally agree, because I, I think King is trying to go for this kind of, you know, flat faced, like confident, like badass. Um, but but yeah, the, the, he keeps interjecting these little bits and these little like every time something is very Western, something else comes in to kind of shift things and and, and shift our character a little bit. Yeah. And, and I really like the idea that Roland goes down to the well, realizes that Brown could easily kill him by dropping a rock on him mm-hmm. and that he might mm-hmm. do it. And, uh, but then he thinks he literally just thinks he likes Brown. So he decides he doesn't want to think about it and then he yeah. doesn't anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's just like a great, it's a great bit, bit of humanization to him where like, there's no strategy there. It's just like, well, I like him. So I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm just going to ignore this. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to me that every time Roland sits down for even a minute um, up to this point, he's overcome with fragments of memory. Yep. Th- this time when he goes to get the water, it's about a, a boy named Shimi and and others, uh, unnamed others who are all gone now. Yeah, that is true. That is that I can't say anything more. But yes, I think you're I think you're right to point out that especially in this early part of the book, any any slow, any sl- like slow movement or like sitting down or being introspective for even a second immediately goes to the past. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, right? Because he's walking forward, he's chasing someone and yet all his, the entire chapter is concerned with what is behind him. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I I like this exchange. Also, do you believe in an afterlife? The The gunslinger asked him as Brown dropped three years of hot corn onto his plate. Brown nodded. I think this is it. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's so, 
That's so great. And like, yeah. regardless of whether you take it literally or not, it's just, it's perfect. Like, it's a perfect way of saying like, yeah, that's how bad that's how, like, this is basically hell. Um, yeah, we're in hell. Yeah. 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 Um, and I'll also, um, I, I never read Secret, Secret Window, but I watched the film. So hot corn, ears of hot corn uh, reminds me of Secret Window in a very creepy way. It makes me wonder yeah. what's fertilizing the corn in the desert, Scott. Oh, I don't, I don't know, Matt. Secret I, window was definitely written after this, but I don't know. Okay. <laughs> no, Worried. I, think that, I think that's really cool. That's really, that's, that's a really good pull. And I mean, one of the things that Stephen King does, and, and we're going to talk about them sometimes, not every time his world is all interconnected. So everything connects. And one of the things, one of the passages in which through his worlds, his stories connect is this series, right? Um, so most of them are just kind of fun, like Easter eggy things. So it would not surprise me at all. If when Stephen King was writing secret window, he was thinking of the, the corn <laughs> outside of this hut in this, uh-huh. book because he does this constantly. Uh, uh-huh. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll keep that in <laughs> I'm mind. I'm not saying there's a dead person under the corn, man. <laughs> That's just not what I'm saying. Okay. But, but there could be, <laughs> but there could be. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so he like with his mind, like stuck on the traps or the fact that this could be a trap set by the man in black, Roland, uh, begins talking about Tull, the last town he was in. And he, he says it doesn't exist anymore. He killed it. Um, Roland, the the funniest part about this whole thing is Roland like keeps expecting Brown to ask him questions. Um, and he's like, they're sitting down, they're eating dinner now. And he's like, okay, this is it. This is when he's going to ask me questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Why am I chasing this guy? And Brown just doesn't. He just seems totally uninterested. He doesn't want to ask. He, he, but Roland like seems really eager to tell the story. And I think part of that is because he's working through the process of, of really coming to terms with what happened and what he did. Um, and, and he really wants to tell it. But the interesting thing about this to me is he's almost unable to do it unless he's asked. Like, like there, there is this moment where he starts kind of trying to tell it and he can't find the words. And then he goes and, and pees and comes back and Brown's like, okay, if you need me to ask you, tell me about Tull. And it's like, then, then the words come. It's, it's, it's kind of to me like talking about, the power of asking for a story as opposed to just like throwing a story at someone. Yeah. Yeah. I I liked all that. I I figured, I figured what you said, you know, Roland desperately wants to get something off of his conscience and to talk about what happened in the town. And he keeps feeding Brown these tantalizing clues that any reasonable person would follow up on. Um, But fundamentally he needs Brown to be a confessor for him. Yeah. And, And I think, I guess in his mind, part of that is he can't just unload on the guy. The guy has to, be kind of complicit in the uh in the in the situation by asking yeah. him first yeah if this is uh roland sitting down in the confession box in a catholic church brown the priest needs to start the 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 tradition himself right yeah. like you don't just start talking to a priest the priest says tell me what is your confession yeah. right that's part of the ritual of of confession in catholicism yeah and and yeah i agree this is almost this is this is roland's confession yeah totally so we flash back again and for those of you keeping score at home we're now nested three deep in flashbacks uh, as roland so we've got yeah we've got he's he's sleeping at the at the fire and then we flash back to his interaction with Brown. And then in this interaction with Brown, he's telling this Tull story. So that's three, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. As Roland walks into Tull for the first time, we see the town. It is this rundown four road town. Most of the houses are empty. The The sign in front of the town is described as chewed, which is just a delightful <laughs> word there. I yeah. really like that. Like there's people around. He's seeing more people like. This is a, this is almost very, very much a contrast to the start of the book because like there are wagons going by, there are people traveling like he he's in kind of civilization, but nobody's looking at him like everyone's pretending like they don't see him. People are off doing their own thing. It still feels dead, even with people around. Um, and one of the first things we hear as he walks into this town is the Beatles. We hear, hey, Jude, another seemingly weird anachronism in this in, in this world that we don't really understand yet. Um, but it, it's it's just it's just we're we're walking into this town and that is not the thing you would expect to hear right it's yeah the Beatles. It, it's this great mix of standard western tropes and then slightly off weird elements that just make you really uncomfortable overall yeah 
Yeah. And they, and they start asking questions like, is this the future is like, did, did, did civilization end? And then this is the, the remnants of that hundreds of years in the future where some bits of, of the world came. Is it something else? We don't know yet. Yeah. Like, uh, is it alternate history? Is time a horseshoe? I mean, seriously, like you, you, uh, at this point, I'm more just asking questions and keeping my yeah. mind open than having theories. So. Do you have? I mean, but do you have like one? <laughs> I, I mean, I think there's some kind of supernatural corruption that has basically eaten this world. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think this used to be its own world, like possibly a fantasy world with bird people, and and then some kind of magical calamity has just kind of ground it down into into this thing that it is now. Cool. Um, like I I don't if, if if I have to say I don't think this was like literally our world and then it turned into this i think this was something off center of our world and then it turned into this cool yeah it's my current thought yeah i like that um i just want to say before we move on here matt and i have done this kind of podcast before but we're switching roles for this one and i've always had to do the the newbie role and matt's always had to do the guy that knows all the answers role and i just want to say this is really hard (laughs) and I have utmost respect for your ability to do this because there are, I mean like in this chapter without giving too much away, there are clues to all this stuff present in, in the words here. Sure. Um, And, and a lot of this for me is like, do I want to pull this out? Do I want to, to shine a light on this particular thing? Is that too much of a clue? Is he going to notice it himself? And, and that's a, it's an interesting balance. And, but I I do, I just want to say that there is stuff there. Like King is like playing a long game with setting up a lot of this stuff. Um, and I think for those of you that maybe are reading it for only the second time or, or know where all this shakes out to be, I bet you're noticing all this stuff just like I am. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the good, that's kind of the right way to set up uh, the beginning of a story is where everything is in place, but it's it's kind of underspecified where it, mm-hmm. could, it could mean so many different things that you'd have to be a genius or, I mean, it's literally impossible for me to just take these elements and say like, oh yeah, it's definitely this is going to happen. Yeah. Um, but but also just kind of to bring to bring the elements to light, I think it, it is can be interesting because because I can it forces me to think about them for a second and and then and then I'm more likely to remember them later and then the people who have read the book can be like yeah that's that's great that's clever yeah. um, and it'll feel good for me when certain things are revealed and then I can go back and say hey remember this moment this yeah. is what I wanted to say to you then Matt but now I'm going to say it now uh, I think that's going to be a lot of the fun of this and it's like the, I don't I do not think this book is like a mystery in that like there's going to be huge reveals that change everything type of way but there are like parts of the story being seeded here uh, sure that remain to be seen yeah I mean I, I kind of it, it's exciting because when we did this the last time I, I I remember distinctly there was in a there was a thing that happened in the first episode um, of, of the we've got worm podcast where I, I kind of drew your attention to something and then I immediately was like I didn't need to do that <laughs> he, he'll 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 figure it out and and yeah. eventually the story will tell us anyway yeah um, but I think I think it's a thing where you just kind of have to use your judgment um, in terms of wh- what you're going to draw attention to so yeah so hopefully I'll become the mat expert very very quickly on that regard um, I, I I aired on the side of No. Every time Mm -hmm. I brought up something and my question myself was, should I mention this? (laughs) I always said no. Um, And I think that's I think it's going to work that way. I think that's going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can experiment on me, though. Sure. Sure. Uh, So Roland walks into Sheb's, the local honky tonk, looking for a burger. And this is really when King goes like full Western. Like he walks through the bat doors. A guy's plinking at a piano. People are playing cards in the corner. There's a woman behind the bar. Like there's hushed silence. Um, People just are immediately staring at him and at his guns. This is as stereotypically Western as you could possibly get. Yeah. um, I I got nothing to add there. Uh, (laughs) Other than like the the idea of what a gunslinger is, is already obviously not the same thing as what we think of as a gunslinger. So mm-hmm. their reaction just takes on a different color due to that. Um, but yeah, I, I was I wanted to ask you that question because that I, I, I'm glad you picked up on that because, yeah, like gunslinger in our terminology is just like just like just a, a, a Western outlaw dude carrying guns. Right. Um, but in in 
in this world, it seems to have more weight to it. We didn't mention that, but Brown asked, are you a gunslinger? Which is not something in our world you would ask someone that question, right? It seems it seems to be more of a title than it is just a description. Yeah, I, I basically see a gunslinger as an as like a knight, um, except okay. with six shooters instead of a sword. Mm-hmm. Um, Roland yeah. sort of appears to embody this sense of chivalry on some level it's not a typical level it, it, it's not it's not necessarily knightly chivalry but sh- chivalry but he has he is a man who would straighten bad pictures in strange hotel rooms sure um and his name is roland uh roland was a knight of charlemagne and a crusader so that okay might yeah be you, a thing I guess you if you know things <laughs> I, i'm allowed then. i'm allowed to have had a life outside of <laughs> this book <laughs> fine fine um but yeah that's that's my my sense is that there's like the fact that he got his guns from his father and that it's like this lineage mm-hmm. um, and that it, it, it's got this like like this almost religious significance. I don't know if I want to go that far, but but it, it feels that way, at least to him. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. So Roland orders an extravagant amount of food, at least for this area, three burgers. This mm-hmm. is more meat than these people in this place have probably seen in a year. And he pays with gold. Uh, this attracts a lot of attention, like almost immediately. And Roland is confronted by a man, but it's just not just a normal man. It's this really creepy guy. Uh, and it's described as he turned around and stared into the face of a man who had been asleep by the door when he entered. It was a terrible face. The odor of the devil grass was a rank miasma. The eyes were damp. The staring, glaring eyes of one who sees but does not see. Eyes ever turned inward to the sterile hell of dreams beyond control, dreams unleashed, risen out of the sinking swamps of the unconscious. Um, th- first of all, Stephen King can write a book, right? Like, that's yeah. just wonderful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you, not only do you picture it, but you you feel it, right? Mm-hmm. That's yeah. that, That's good yeah. writing. Yeah. And this man clear, like we see clearly he's not just smoking the devil grass, not just inhaling it, but chewing on it directly. And Roland is horrified by this fact. And he almost immediately goes to the man in black did this like this guy should be dead. This is the man in black. And this I think this matches the the paranoia that we saw in in Brown when when Roland approached Brown. And of course, this is in the past from that. So we like it's learned paranoia almost. He walked into this town. This guy immediately approaches him and he's like. Oh, fuck. This is the man in black. Um, and, and we learn a little bit later that this guy is Nort and and Nort addresses him in the high speech of Gilead, a place we don't know about yet. <laughs> but um, it, it's it's a, a language that he has not heard in forever. Uh, nobody else here seems to know what it is or 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 like I think Ali describes it as that strange language like she can't even recognize it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that goes into your whole your whole theory about gunslingers, right? This is, seems to be, um, of course, Gilead is, is, a is a, it has connotations in our language a little bit too, right? Yeah. What's funny is, um, I did not look up the word Gilead. Um, but I, but I, I'm aware that it is like something <laughs> in real life. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, I'm going to have to look yeah. that up for next time and try sure, not to yeah. spoil myself. Yeah. It's, it's biblical. Okay. Okay. Um, Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny how I'm actually almost relieved uh, to have an undead guy show up in this book <laughs> because that's like at least a horror element that I'm familiar with. Like, like it's not it's not I, I can put it in a box, right? It's like, oh, OK, yeah, an, an undead, uh, undead guy. That's that's yeah. a thing. Yeah. OK. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, it, of, it's horrifying, obviously. It kind of maybe goes to uh, to Brown's question, right? Like, are the alive are alive or dead? Right now, right. we're seeing kind of a zombie, so that m- maybe makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, because like everyone is horrified by the presence of Nort, but they're not as horrified as I would be if I saw a dead guy on the street. Yeah, right? it's like it's so weird because he was he was in the bar when when Roland walked in, and he seems comfortable there. Like yeah. everyone's just kind of. It's really interesting when we get to Nort's resurrection, how like casual some of the people take it. Right? Yeah. They're just like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like I, I think the text even points out everything went back to normal like a week later. Yeah, and everyone was just okay. It's Nort. Yeah. Yep. All right. This is the kind of thing that happens around here. Yeah. Right. Right. 
So Roland asks the the woman behind the bar, who we later learn is Alice or Allie, uh, about Nort, asking who he is, and then about the man in black. And her, mo- I love the way the text describes her mood changing because she's like furious and pissed off at him, and then she goes through this this long gamut of emotions, and then eventually just ends on sadness. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's it's specifically triggered by the man in black. This is this is kind of how Ting how King primes us that she has a story to tell. Yeah. Um, and she's willing to trade that story for an itch she needs scratching. Mm-hmm. She wants to bang, Matt. Yeah. She wants to bang real bad. Yeah. It's uh, it's very, very pressing for her. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And our, our hero gunslinger, our knight, as you described it, like gives her the up and down and it is not flattering. Uh-huh. <laughs> like one of the first things he said is the scar would not show in the dark. She's got this this long scar across her face. And he's like, her scar wouldn't show across her dark uh, her body looks okay, but I, I love, um, I, I love like he, the conclusion is not that it mattered. It wouldn't have mattered if the grave beetles had nested in the arid blackness of her womb. It had all been written somewhere, somewhere, some hand had put it all down in Ka's book. So he's just like, he, he objectifies the shit out of her. He looks her up and down and he's like, it doesn't even matter. Um, but she like catches on to this right away. She's like, you don't have to look at me like that. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's it's uh, it's heartbreaking. And I, I think she's a really great character. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think she yeah. kind of makes the this first chapter be something that it definitely wouldn't be if it were just Roland, Roland, Roland all the time. Sure. Um, so, yeah, obviously, like you said, Roland is objectifying her here. But the story goes on from here to humanize her quite beautifully, I, I feel. Uh, I, I do think that it's interesting how sometimes he seems so eager to use this concept of Ka, which I read as fate. Um, cause just by usage, um, it, he uses this concept of Ka to kind of brush away having to think about choices. Mm-hmm. He's just like, like she offers himself, she offers herself in exchange for the story and he's like, ah, oh, well, Ka, Ka wills it. And it's like, oh, okay, Roland, really? Like, I think, <laughs> I think you, I think you want to have sex with her. That's, that's what I think. I, I, or, or you could, you could read it as like, he, he wants the story so badly that he would just pretty much do whatever she asked. Yeah, um, I, I think I think either way, I think you're yeah. you're you're onto something there. Um, his, his use of the use of fate in this book is really interesting. And I think I, I, I'm comfortable enough saying that Ka, I think the book makes it clear enough that Ka is a kind of is their kind of word for like fate. Um, I, I think, I yeah. think he even says in this section, Ka, like like it is it like it is the will of God almost. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think it's pretty clear that it's, it's fate related. So, yeah. and yeah, he does return to this several times throughout this chapter. Uh, spoilers. He will again in the future. Um, so I think that's a really great observation. Yeah. I mean, just phrases like putting it down in Ka's book, like we have our own kind of um, idiom of like fate's book. Um, yeah. So yeah. it just makes sense. Yeah. And I think it's, it's fun how, you know, we've talked a lot about when we read books about this idea of like, getting us to understand the words of the world, um, but doing it in a way that seems natural. And I, I think King does such a good job with that here because you're absolutely right. Like putting it down in Ka's book, we don't have to say what Ka means. We don't have to like have a whole like drawn out explanation. Um, we just, we just like steer close to what people in our world would say. Um, and yeah. it, outside the book would say, and then, um, and then you kind of get the meaning without having to be told the meaning. Yeah. That's one thing is, is we have introduced a, f- a few fantasy words and concepts and I'm, I don't think I'm confused about what words mean. I'm more confused <laughs> about what, what is this world and what, and what is the context of all of this? Yeah. Like, and I wh- think that's, yeah. I think that's the more important question. That's the question that a, an author should want you to be asking, not, what does Ka mean? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Not like I can't understand what you're trying to say because mm-hmm. I don't know what this word means. Yeah, it's yeah. In, in fact, like Tahin, he pretty much immediately explains what a Tahin is. So yeah, st- yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, after having done the deed, uh, the woman finally tells Roland the story of the creepy man Nort. He died and then was then touched by God. We remember that as Roland began his own story to Brown, he mentioned that he killed a man touched by God. So uh spoilers yeah and and this is actually um this is something that king does a lot and he does it multiple times throughout this 
chapter and he does it in his books a lot where he'll drop these random lines in the end that end, end up hinting at or just directly spoiling for lack of a better phrase future events uh, he says it in this book like at, at the, his very last day i think it says and and that is the last time he'd ever see Allie alive right yeah. um and and it's something i want to track through this book and 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 maybe analyze why king tends to do this um in, in fact like this whole chapter is kind of that right like we started off this particular part of the story with um roland saying that he killed tull um so we know the end of the story ends with everyone in this town dead and presumably at roland's hand yeah yeah i'll just say that i really like this as a, as a writing technique and a storytelling technique I, i've complained before that sometimes a book will be practically ruined for me because I'll spend huge chunks of the story just worrying about whether some terrible thing that's been foreshadowed or, or threatened is going to happen or not mm -hmm. to the point that I'm like speed reading to get to the reveal and not paying <laughs> attention to what's actually happening. Sure. Um, and, and in reality, whether or not the thing happens always matters less than the ex execution of how you get there. So I really don't mind King doing this and kind of releasing the tension, but then like it doesn't really release the tension is the thing because you, you're like okay he kills the town what does that look like what does that mean yeah. why you're still full of questions which is which is exactly where you should be and i would almost say if you have no idea what's going to happen then there are no questions in your mind because anything is possible but yeah th this way he is he has sort of programmed these questions into you i i would argue it almost increases the tension because sometimes he'll just drop them at the end of a sentence where you weren't expecting it. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, well, and that was the last time Jeff was alive. Yeah. And you're like, wait, what? Yeah. What's going to happen to Jeff? And and you're actually like, I think it 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 gives you a hook to to push further into the book sometimes. And I yeah. the the execution is the most important thing is a statement that I agree with 100%. Um I am not a person that's huge about spoilers. I like I I'm not going to spoil this book for you because I think part of this process is you experiencing it for the first time and I think there is importance to that, but yeah, I mean like if you find out something that happens in book 2, it's not going to ruin the story for you. Um especially when it's like designed into the text in the way that it is where where King does it here. Yeah, sure. Sure. But it is not the last time we'll see him do that. Like, I've been reading a lot of King books lately, and he just does it all the, all the time. He really <laughs> likes doing that. That's great. Anyway, the woman who we do learn is named Alice begins to tell her story. And we are now on page 40 of this book, and we are now four flashbacks deep. How do you, how do you feel about that, Matt? I mean, just just the general structural choice to open the story with. Um. Yeah, I don't know. It, it definitely um, kind of... <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. Um, I should have thought about this more beforehand. <laughs> that's no problem. <laughs> yeah, like it, it makes you feel like so it left me with this feeling that where where we start the book feels like it's closer to the end of the story chronologically and that we're we're going back to, like it leaves me feeling like everything requires explanation. Everything everything that we know is nested in the past. Sure. Right. There's this theme of Roland constantly thinking about the past. Every time something happens, we, we need to find out the story behind it, which may need in order to tell the story behind it. You need to tell the story behind that. Right. I mean, like he's literally sitting here telling this story to Brown and in doing so telling the story that Alice told him. Right. Or, or, yeah. or, or I mean, maybe you can't don't necessarily know that that's what's happening. But but um, this we idea assume, that like yeah. the, the, the past is kind of nested recursively and depends on itself in this recursive way. And like, when are you done? Like, when have you told the whole story? How far back do you have to go to tell the whole story? It gives you this really interesting feeling of like, how much do I need to know to understand what's actually going on? And, uh, yeah. and I, I love that. Yeah, I like that, too. And and I, I, I think it also goes back to the thing I, I said a little bit earlier that we have like the the. the inciting incident if we want to call it that of this book is that roland is chasing this guy across the desert and yet the first chapter of it doesn't give a shit about that like it it, it, it is irrelevant like that the that point in the book it doesn't matter yet it's all about the places he's already been not the place where he's going yeah exactly yeah 
All right, so uh, our flashback starts, our fourth flashback starts with the man in black entering Tull. And uh, this is almost as if we're recreating the scene where, where Roland entered again, but everything's a little bit different. Um, I, I love how, like, the look and, and the people respond to his presence here. Like, like just how it, the town is described, the sky was the yellow color of old cheese and the, the clouds flew across it. And then we see that the owner of the livery, a man named Kennerly, is like fondling the breast of his daughter or something. Just this really disgusting thing that the book kind of casually mentions it. It's almost as if just his presence in the story, like causes the book to emphasize the most terrible things about the setting and the people in the town. Um, it's just like, he, he just he's there and so we're emphasizing all this awfulness and then it's all kind of counteracted what this like this smile he's wearing which king calls a horrid happy grin i like the idea that that his presence is almost distorting the text because there's no way that alice knows that he was fondling his daughter in this moment he sure so so therefore this is not alice's story this is the text just letting us in on all of the the ugliness that's happening yeah. surrounding this this guy um yeah I, I i like this idea that 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 the text distorts to make the whole world uglier when he's present that's mm -hmm. cool yeah and, and i want to contrast roland's entrance with the man in blacks because we've already seen some of it the way that they enter town but as they walk into shebs it's it's different too roland walks into silence and everyone's attention the man in black kind of slips in unnoticed the only person that notices him is alice he orders a whiskey roland orders beer and burgles burgers she she gives him top shelf whiskey um even though she could have lied to him roland like asks for bread and also about the stock of the beef. And she lies to him twice about that. Roland pays in gold. The man in black pays in silver. So there's this this kind of it, it. They're they're going through the same process, but we're seeing and these subtle differences are, are kind of emphasized for us. Yeah, like the, they're treading the same steps and, and thus everything that they do differently is, is emphasized. I like exactly, that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly he's kind of casually having this conversation with with Allie, who is like incredibly uncomfortable just by his presence, like his eyes, the, like the way he's looking at her, the, the thing she's saying to him or he's saying to her rather. And then suddenly he like wants to show her something. So he stands up, walks over to the, the, the corpse of Nort. I, we should have said this like at Shebs is his wake. Like there's a corpse sitting in the middle of the room. Um, and everyone's kind of partying for his wake. And he just like hocks a loogie in his face. And then he just starts spitting over and over again. Other people join in and there's this like raucous dance party. And he starts uh, like Jack knife knifing over the corpse over and over again, laughing maniacally. Um, and basically that's the magic that brings Nort back to life. And it's this kind of like horrifying, uh, otherworldly, like just uncomfortable magic. Like it's not like pretty magic. It's not like, like awe inspiring. It's, it's madness almost. Yeah. It's weird and upsetting and unnatural. It's almost goofy. Um, yeah. except goofy implies a kind of lightheartedness, which is not present at all. Like you, you feel like the characters in the scene where you're kind of unnerved by it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it like I goofy is a good word because like it, it, you want to you want to categorize it as goofy because mm -hmm. it's like he's he's jumping over the body and like flipping onto like jumping over and hand springing onto his hands and then and then like and like cackling and ever like people are like joining in and then suddenly being freaked out and and like by the end of it everyone has run out of the the place so it's just it's just so it's so weird but the end result is nort comes back and there's this like one of the things we should say is that ever since the man in black has shown up Alice Allie has been like uncomfortably attracted to him. Like she feels this, this almost uncontrollable desire. I think at one point, like while he's performing the spell, it's implied she's touching herself. Yeah. I um, think so. Yeah. And, and it's, it's like, so there's, we've talked a lot there and we're going to talk a lot. Like King likes to write about sex a whole bunch, but there is a lot of like, a lot of sexual desire attached to the magic of this situation. And we'll see that again. Um, and I, I think it's, it's off putting in the exactly the way King wants it to be. Yeah. Yeah. He's really, that's, what's really kind of, you could study this, this part of the, you know, this page or two is, is all it is really where he's, he's using all of these tools where 
nothing about it is is horror in the classic sense of like the the simple buttons that you push to evoke horror it's all mm-hmm. just stuff where you it, it's just weird and you don't know what to do with it you don't know how to process it yeah. and that makes you more uncomfortable than like i was kind of joking earlier when i was like oh a, a living dead guy i i know what to do with that <laughs> but like this i don't know what to do with it it it, le- it leaves me uncomfortable and uncertain mm-hmm. and that's actually more effective here And I think it works exactly because Alice is the one telling the story. This is Allie's story, and that's how she felt. And she didn't understand. She didn't understand why she was doing that, why she had this this unquenchable desire, why she grabbed her belly in the middle of this and then and then went further down. Mm -hmm. Like it's horrifying to her as well. And she runs and she flees flees up to her room to just get away from all this. Um, And and then when she comes back down, the man in black is gone and Nort is just there, just chilling just hanging out yeah. um and eventually he comes to Allie and brings her a piece of paper which is a message from the man in black um in which he explains that he has uh, left a word for her the word is 19 if you say it to him him being nort his mind will be opened he will tell you what lies beyond he will tell you what he saw the word is 19 knowing it will drive you mad but sooner or later you will ask you won't be able to help yourself have a nice day Walter Odim is the way he signs it. So we have the man in black's name at last. His name is Walter Odim. Interestingly enough, we still don't have Roland's name. So we learn the man in black's name before we learn Roland's name. Yeah. I mean, a, a part of me uh, doesn't even believe it's his real name, but, but sure. Yeah. We, we, sure. we, we learned this name for the man in black. Yeah. Sure. It is a very kind of goofy name, right? Like, like Odim is like, like uh, you, I, you immediately think Jack O'Lantern in my mind. Um, it's kind of a, uh, uh, like a, a a silly name it is it is it's it's um it means darkness mm-hmm. but but it yeah. means darkness in a way that is not very intimidating <laughs> yeah yeah right. um and apparently walter means army ruler i looked this up um <laughs> so i guess if he's like you know ruler of the armies of darkness or something sure. i don't know we'll see where that goes yeah um yeah So let's talk about 19. This is the joke I made to you in our introduction episode. But we basically have this moment where he gives this word and and Allie finishes her story to Roland and and knowing full well that she's going to say this word one day and it will destroy her. Mm. And let's talk about that as a plot device, because it's really interesting to me. I mean, it does all kinds of work for you. Like it basically tells you, okay, the afterlife of this world uh, is implied to be so horrible that knowing about it would destroy you and drive you mm-hmm. mad. That's 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 just a great piece of knowledge by itself. <laughs> Even if you don't know what the nature of the afterlife is, you know that that's how bad it is. Um, now there's a ticking clock element in that there's this this the threat hanging over Allie, who by this point I think we like and we care about. Yeah. Um, and and also just the idea that um, okay now we've seen the the man in black. Uh, bring a guy back to life and then just like just for the hell of it maybe because it kind of amuses him he leaves this psychological death trap for this woman yeah um for no, like she didn't do anything she doesn't this is just the kind of thing that it, it gives the impression this is the kind of thing he does he just leaves in his wake these disasters um yeah and well, well presumably that's why i mean like he brought back this guy just for the hell of it too yeah just to, like to show he could right um, yeah. And, and I, I think I think we learn a little bit later that all of this is kind of him like eating this town and, mm-hmm. and setting it as a trap for the, the, the gunslinger. Um, and I kind of when we get to the, the springing of the trap, I want to talk about the nature of the trap with you a little bit. But sure. um, I, I love I love that Roland like is immediately like, yeah, you're definitely going to say it like that's 100 percent like like. Uh, this is just like i think he describes like don't imagine your mom naked or something yeah and then your brain's gonna do it because it it knows it shouldn't um and it is it is like he, he he's almost impressed by it he says it's clever in its in its uh horribleness or something to that effect yeah um and i i really i really like it as a just a plot structure um yeah i mean it's great psychological horror i, I don't think i expected it to be paid off as quickly as it actually ends up being mm-hmm. um yeah um, well, yeah, but although although then then I have to say it's not really paid off because Alice now knows what 19 means, but we don't. So sure. that's still a mystery for us. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So. So now for the first time in the novel, we began to roll out of our inception dream levels of flashbacks and we return out of Allie's story to the third level. Roland back in bed thinks he uh, ought to get out of this town 
uh, as every day he st- st- spends here, Walter Odim, the man in black, uh, is getting further away. And surely he set a trap for him here. Mm-hmm. And yet, and yet, Matt, he stays. Um, and the, the, this part of the chapter ends with Ali kind of thinking to herself, he was like something out of a fairy tale or myth, a fabulous, dangerous creature. Could he grant witches? She thought the answer was yes, and that she would have hers. He would stay a while. That was wish enough for a luckless, scarred bitch such as she. Tomorrow was time enough to think of another or a third. Yeah, th- that that's really, I mean, it's really interesting how, like you said, Roland just kind of decides to stay in the town for a while with no real explanation. Like his mission compels him to pursue the man in black. He suspects the town is a trap mm-hmm. and he's right. Yeah. Uh, everything is pushing him to move on, but he doesn't. Why? Um, I mean, at this point, you know, re- reflecting back on chapter one, could just be that he would rather rest and just have some minor measure of pleasure in his life rather than yeah. just constantly being forced to trudge onward. Um, we also know that he is afraid of the desert, although he doesn't want to face this fact. Um, and so maybe he's he's literally just kind of malingering because he he doesn't want to he doesn't want to leave, um, yeah. which is a very human motive, right? I, it absolutely is. And and I think I think on some level he likes Allie. And yeah, and like I, I think that is actually like one thing we see throughout this chapter a lot. And, and I, I, I think we're going to see going forward is this idea of Roland, um, on this, this chase and how he gets pulled to the side by these things, but eventually must leave them, but always seems hesitant to do so. Um, that definitely happens here. And there is, I mean, I like that there's also like a magical element to it as well, right? Like, I think this is probably metaphor in the way that she's describing him, this this mythical creature that could grant her wishes. But also it seems to be like through this and through um, possibly the magic of Brown asking for the story, there seems to be some level of of Roland that when asked something or when like give not a command, but a, a request from someone he's like obliged to do it somehow. Yeah. I mean, that does remind me of the moment where she, uh, where he says it's written down in Ka's book that they're going to go upstairs and bang. And it's like, right, it, right. And, and it's almost like he's pretending there's no choice to it. Maybe there literally is no choice to it Yeah, um, yeah. for him. Um, yeah. I, I think the cool thing about this is either explanation is, is kind of equally plausible and I, I they also could probably exist on top of each other. Like mm-hmm. there is a very human reason for wanting to stay here. He likes this person. He, likes rest uh he has a bed here he's comfortable there's food um he doesn't have this terrifying desert to which most people are like no there's no end to this thing yeah Uh, it's never gonna end you're just gonna keep going until you die right um so there's that is a very human reason but also there is this on top of this there is this possible mythological otherworldly fantastical reason i feel like if it were just magic then he'd be a little bit more resentful of the fact that he's being you know quote unquote trapped there sure Um, sure but I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. But in the morning, speaking of the desert, Roland, uh, as much as he wants to stay and also wants to go, he's like having to like kind of almost go through the emotions because he goes out and like asks some of the residents of Tull. He we get to meet or Roland gets to meet the wonderfully dreadful Kennerly, who was seen, who was the, the livery uh, attendant who was uh, abusing his daughter. Yeah. Disgustingly. I hate this guy. Yeah, he's he's the worst. He's yeah. absolutely terrible. Um, but he is the one that would know what's beyond the desert. So he asks him and and we see here that he he doesn't. You don't know what's after the desert. Kennerly shrugged. Some might. The coach ran through part of it 50 years ago. My pap said so. He used to say twas mountains. Others say an ocean, a green ocean with monsters. And some say that's where the world ends, that there ain't nothing but lights that'll drive a man blind and the face of God with his mouth open to eat them up drivel. The gunslinger said shortly. So yeah, I want to talk about that. And I, I bolded a part for you. <laughs> yeah. It's probably exactly uh, what's there. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I know enough from cultural osmosis to recognize that like there, there might be an it reference somewhere in wow. here. Yeah. That's really impressive. Yeah. Uh, um, without spoiling it too much, this is a reference to a thing called the deadlights. Okay. Um, and that's all I'm going to say. Uh, it is a thing that exists in it. Um, yeah. And that's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah. And and that's, I mean, that, that that seemed kind of clear to me. I haven't actually read that book or actually seen that movie, but I'm, I'm fascinated I, how you know about this. It's yeah, it's, really it's, interesting it's, to me. It is. In, it is. 
<laughs> it is interesting the things that I have read that I can't account for why or when or where. Um, um, but it's the kind of thing that just makes me desperate to read more. Um, can I say I, I knew this would happen? I knew that I would immediately get into the story and just want to just binge it. Cause like I, now I need to find out what's on the other side of that desert. Mm-hmm. And now I'm just furious that you won't let me just binge it. I'm sorry, Matt. You have to wait like I did for so many months. This you is hell. This yeah. is hell. <laughs> you could go read it in your off time, I guess, if you wanted to. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> All right. I mean, as to the rest of it, I mean, it, it, I just love that. I love that. It's like, could be anything and whatever it is, it's nightmarish though. Mm-hmm. And that yeah. makes you excited about finding out what it is. Yeah. So we cut forward to four days later. And the gunslinger is still in Tull. He has relaxed to the point where Sheb, the piano player, and I guess owner of the 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 honky tonk, although it never actually says that. Like, it's called Sheb's. We make the assumption that this is his place. But all he does is play the piano. He doesn't seem like he owns it. He doesn't live there. Um, yeah, that's interesting. But, but Sheb uh, attacks him and Allie in bed. Roland very casually just breaks his wrists, uh, cat- taking away the one thing he could do, which is play the piano. And then um, we get this moment where he he earlier when he saw him, he recognized the name and wasn't sure for, where from. And then here in this moment, he recognizes him. And we have uh, this kind of once again, Roland is looking backward to a town called Mihis uh, with a woman named Susan. And uh, I don't think it's a spoiler here to say, Matt, that this is something that is being set up for the future of the series. Uh, but yeah, we should we should remember poor maimed Sheb. Good old Sheb. Yeah, this is the kind of thing where he he has these flashbacks and I'm like, I I just I know we're going to find out more about these people. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because we're going to meet them again or if it's because we're going to get more flashbacks that clarify who they were. Um, But uh, I I feel confident that we're going to find out more about them. Sure. Yeah, I do like that. It's it's four days removed and and he immediately like comments on the fact that he's gotten too comfortable because he allows this guy to sneak up on him. Um, Yeah, right. And I'm curious what you think of Roland at this point, because like he does casually break this guy's hands or his yeah. arm or like his wrist just like very casually bats them away, breaking them. Um, and like, I think the book does a very good job of going between like this kind person that genuinely cares about people and this kind of just asshole. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I basically at this point see Roland as this kind of person who, who was a poor sensitive soul who had a really hard, terrible life that we, we may or may not find out more about that has shaped him into this man with no name, badass killer type person. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I really want to find out how this happened. Like I would love, I would love to find out the journey of how he went from being, you know, a child, uh, <laughs> to, to, to being this person. Um, sure. is this a prediction? I, I think I kind of want to make it a prediction that like, all right, do it. The, do whole, it. the whole series is going to be flashbacks. Uh, I think Roland camping out in the, in, in the desert is the future, uh, or, or like the end of the story. Um, and, and cause, cause as it stands, I don't know. I mean, I'm basing all this off very, very little information, but sure. But the fun of this is, is making the, it's calling the shots, right? So yeah, yeah, man, you gotta you gotta roll those dice. Yeah, yeah. That's all <laughs> cool. I got for now. All right. Um, on the fifth day that Roland has been until a Sunday, he heads to the local church, and we meet Sylvia Pittston, the local preacher. Who? Uh, well, I'll just I'll just let King describe her. No description could take measure of the woman, breasts like earthworks, a huge pillar of a neck overtopped by a pasty white moon of a face in which blinked eyes so large and so dark that they seemed to be bottomless tarns. Her hair was a beautiful rich brown, and it was piled atop her head in a haphazard sprawl, held by a hairpin, almost big enough to be a meat skewer. She wore a dress that seemed to be made of burlap. The arms that held the hymnal were slabs. Her skin was creamy, unmarked, lovely. He thought that she must top 300 pounds. He felt a sudden red lust for her that made him feel shaky, and he turned his head and looked away. I feel like I haven't read all that much King, but this is still somehow classic King. It It, it is. <laughs> like, it's it's wonderful because, like, she he describes her as this massive woman. And, like, first of all, I just the name, like, Sylvia Pittston just uh-huh. has such a connotation to it, right? Yeah. Um. And then, like, it's this, this description of this this giant woman tops 300 pounds. She has a pillar of a neck. Um, the, the, the 
thing that's in her hair is a meat skewer. She's wearing a dress made of burlap, which is this this rough, coarse fabric. And then her her skin was creamy and unmarked. He felt a sudden red lust for her um, like he sees her. And, and and I think this is specifically, you know, like we've, we've kind of set up the presence of the man in black is something that just made Allie just immediately feel lustful. And I think we're, we're doing that again here. Like he, he's seeing Sylvia. We're going to learn eventually that, that Sylvia has had a, a very intimate relationship with the man in black. And I think that's part of it here is this 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 kind of the, the evil magics are in sexually intoxicating yeah. in some way, which is interesting because we've already established that uh, Roland and, and Alice have had a sexual relationship by this point and that they're both yeah. getting a lot of like comfort and solace out of it. Yeah. So the book is not saying sex bad. Um, the sure. book is, the book is maybe just telling us, all right, sex is a thing that, that exists and humans do it. And, the man in black seems to have some kind of supernatural power that he manifests through um, through sex and lust. And, and, and yeah. it, uh, more like it's interesting because lust it's, is a very specific thing. It's it's this like semi uncontrollable desire feeling that that distorts thought. Right. Which is not necessarily the same. It, it would be an error to just say that, oh, that's the same thing as the sexual uh, you know, reality of a human being. Um I don't I don't know where this is going exactly. I, I feel like so. So the, the reason I went on that little tangent just now was like, I feel like one of the mysteries of this book is going to be what is the man in black? Like, mm-hmm. like what what is his deal? What is what is the nature of evil in this world? And what is the nature of his power? And are those two things the same? Is that the same question? Um and in doing so, I'm trying to dig into what is King's kind of metaphysics or his or maybe even his psychology of like, sure. the, it, like it seems important to distinguish between two people wanting to have sex and having sex versus like the we- weird lustful energy that the red that, that, that the that the um, that the man in black exudes. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. No, I, I think that's perfect. And, and I, I really agree with that. I, I do think that's it's it's a very important distinction and one that he makes again and again. Right there. There is there is the relationship between Allie and Roland is while Roland kind of dismisses her at first, like you said before King immediately humanizes her. And then it is this kind of beautiful relationship. Like all they do for four days is eat, drink and bang. Yeah. And, and, and they're, they, they feel for each other in in some sort of way. And Roland is kind of rough with his emotions. Like he doesn't release them very much, but even Allie can tell like, he's feeling for her in some way. Um, and yeah, and, and we, we contrast this with, um, the, the father with his daughter, that, that disgustingness, we contrast this with, with this almost uh, uncontrollable urge and lust. And it is distinct. It is different. And that distinction is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like this is going to be the kind of thing that, that goes forward and maybe we get some more clarity on it as we go. Yeah. And I think just generally say if, if there are people listening to this that have not read a lot of Stephen King, uh, he's going to talk about sex a lot. Like he I, I think Matt and I were talking about this before we hit record, but King is very much interested in exploring the depths of human psychology in that like and behavior. And and part of that is like the animalistic desires that people have sometimes. And so he's going to, he's going to plumb those things. He really wants to, to explore what makes, what sometimes makes horrible people horrible. Um, and that involves some very uncomfortable sexual situations. Sometimes I don't think anything like truly like, like a- anger inducing. I'm trying to remember, I don't want to state something, but this is something that, that is going to be repeated throughout the story for mm-hmm. sure. Okay. Um, so Sylvia drones on about how she knows and loves every character in the Bible. She lists a bunch of Old Testament characters uh, and some New Testament. I think she talks about Mary as well. Save one, the interloper, the devil. Sylvia then preaches about him, whipping the crowd up into this terrible frenzy. And then she demands that the townspeople promise that if they ever see the interloper, uh, importantly, walking the streets of Tull, that they would strike out at him immediately. And then in this moment, I love this because she like dramatically points towards the door and he's like hit, hidden in the shadows right by the door. So it becomes very obvious that it's like the gunslinger is the interloper. <laughs> yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and this is once again, like 
we're talking about the, the the beats of like this this overpowering lust we're also talking about this this otherworldly frenzy um that that these evil characters are whipping people into like every time something quote unquote evil is going on in this book things become very animalistic mm-hmm and I think that's important. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I I'll I'll make a note of that in my mm-hmm. in my book. Um, Let's talk about king and religion, though. Yeah, because sure. We we've talked about a lot of religious terms, like we talked about Gilead, and and you said like you hinted at some some religion, like we've talked about the man Jesus, and you've we've hinted at some stuff around gunslingers, possibly. Yeah. Um, but this is like very seriously. This is a church. This is a uh, and amalgamation of a christian church kind of because it's the christian bible they're talking about here um it's a fallen church yes. um <laughs> yeah um it, i mean it's interesting because my touchstones are carrie where the religious person is carrie's mom who's evil and, and <laughs> terrible and needful things where the religious people are basically just sort of fools like 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 <laughs> like, like they're like it's sort of a they're sort of the butt of a joke Sure. Um, which again is not the same. It's not the same thing as saying religion is is awful, but religious people in his books do seem to be instruments of evil more often than not. I would, I mean, in my in my very limited experience, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I and and to to fully go into like, I I don't like bringing extra textual stuff in too much, but King it, it believes in a god. He believes in a higher power, but he mostly can't stand the concept of organized religion. Mm. And I think one of the things that fascinates him about it the most is the corrupting nature of it. And, and in all those instances you just talked about, that is exactly what's happening, right? It's people using, using the, the idea of a higher power, using the idea of religion in a, in a corrupting kind of way. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of exactly what's going on with, with Sylvia here. Yeah. Yeah. So, then I think we, we move on from there. He kind of leaves the church in a hurry. And then we kind of the chapters kind of start to speed up a bit here where they're well, the sections rather where they're just smart little bits. And Roland's time is coming to an end. I think on the final day, it literally says this was his final day. He knew it. And both he and Allie seem to know it somehow mm-hmm. that this is his last day here. Um, he goes out on his final day to Sylvia's to confront her because he knows there's something going on with this woman. Uh, and he, he like there's this whole back and forth where he like has to get Allie to tell him where she lives, um, which like I like that as part of like Allie, like knowing that this is going to be what triggers him leaving. But also like the town's not that big role. And like mm-hmm. he probably just like <laughs> and I think her house is like behind the church. Right. <laughs> where, where, where is you she? Might where is Sylvia? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But it, anyway, it seems uh, more symbolic. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I totally that's kind of where I was going with it. It's it's the like it's almost as if to go back to our kind of mystical metaphysical thing, like sh- they both know him going to that house will be his end and getting Allie to tell him is basically her allowing him to leave. Right. Mm-hmm. Like her releasing him almost in kind of a way. Yeah, I agree. Um, so he goes there, he confronts her and turns out she's been touched by a God, too, in in the no, no place. Yeah, yeah. The man in black put a child in her, a god, a king, as she describes it, but as Roland describes it, a demon. And Roland um, gun slings the baby. Um, that's he he sticks he sticks his gun up in her, killing the child, um, and and then forces Sylvia to tell him what lies beyond the desert. That's the one question he wanted to know. And I think probably the thing he needed to know before he could work up the, the bravery to go out there, what is beyond the desert? She tells him it's mountains, mountains where the man in black will be stopping there to make his strength to meditate. So it's kind of like laying the seeds for this is where the confrontation is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause this is kind of horrifying thing that Roland does here. Um, the yeah. fact that she's, basically like a kind of monster who has a demon in her womb, I guess kind of ameliorates the sense of how bad it is, but it's, it's still, um, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the moments for me where you're kind of shifting uncomfortably at what a ruthless person this guy is and, and, and how, um, uh, utter, utterly, um, uncompromising he is when it comes to anything about the man in black. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think that's what King is going for there. That 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 feeling that you had, that uncomfortable feeling of what is he willing to do when it comes to mm-hmm. finding where this man is and, and finding what's going on and, and chasing him. Um, I think you're supposed to feel that. Mm-hmm. So I think I think King is going very hardcore with this. This is a, this is an uncomfortable scene. I mean, and he does not hold back like we see the, the act occurs in the text yeah. an act i'm not even fully comfortable like vocalizing right, right. now yeah um, it's upsetting yeah yeah it is very upsetting it is designed to be upsetting because you're supposed to you're supposed to be like oh jesus I yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know about that <laughs> right i i felt the same and um I, but i i think i think the like, maybe the important thing is to say that king knows exactly what he's doing he knows exactly mm-hmm. what impression he's creating with that um yeah i, I think it's safe to assume anyway so I also will say that this like this is not an excuse, but it was also 1982. Uh-huh. Um, the the world has moved on since then, <laughs> and uh, and interesting and we, usage. Like I I, I do not think like I think we're gonna come up with some things in this book where I think Stephen King of 2020 would look back at the stuff and be like, yeah, I'd probably do that a little differently. Um, but I mean, part of the reason this works for me is because the imagery is so disturbing in, 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 in the off putting and uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, if you take it, if you like, it's interesting because if it's literally a demon, like it, it's, it's, it's a horrifying level of power and, and evil that this guy exhibits. And, mm-hmm. and you start to, you start to see why Roland, uh, is, is so, you know, uh, I guess obsessed. Yeah. He's yeah, t- completely yeah. obsessed, right? Like there's nothing else to him except this, this quest that he's on. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so continuing our religion conversation from before, this part is kind of interesting to me because like at the start of this conversation, Sylvia is, is like calling Roland, uh, uh, easy. Like he's a whore. Uh, she, she says he hides in the shadow of the light. He is the antichrist and the man in black is a God. She says all this stuff. And then by the end of the conversation, she says that the child that Roland kills is the child of the crimson King, which is the name that she used for the devil in her earlier sermon right Mm -hmm. so it it seems like she's like being knowingly hypocritical here where she's like declaring roland the antichrist the devil the interloper while also being fully aware that the name the the crimson king which is the name she gives to the devil is walter odim is the man in black um and and i think that's really interesting yeah yeah absolutely um the crimson i I believe my my knowledge of of the the band King Crimson is that that's some kind of reference to King. So um, I'm going to assume this is a this is a bad thing mm-hmm. in in the King verse. Yes. Um, yeah. No. I I don't I mean uh, uh, other than what you just said, like the fact that she is almost delusional about like like does she know or does she not know or is is, is she has she, has she been um, bewitched? Uh, yeah. The uh, the charitable I'm, interpretation is that she's just kind of so manipulated and confused that she doesn't even know anymore yeah that she's been she's been set on this path by uh by the man in black to the point where like she has very little control over what she is or is not understanding anymore mm-hmm. um but we also like i, I love that ali is like the only good person in tall right like the, the the story kind of goes out of its way to set her up as like the only decent person on this ass end of the world and she is the also the only one that doesn't go to church. Like there's this mm-hmm. very distinct, like she's like, I'm not going there. She's she poison religion mm-hmm. is what Allie calls it. And while we're there, who do we see? We see Kennerly, the, mm-hmm. the guy who is like literally the worst human being ever in this book um, is going to church and like being swept up into this whole thing. So yeah. um, I think I think probably even before the man in black came through town, Sylvia was not the best person. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I kind of I kind of like reading it as she was like knowingly aware that a lot of this is just bullshit that mm-hmm. she's peddling. Yeah, I think she was a very she was like a perfect tool for him. Um, yeah. And and yeah, I, I like that idea that she she gets off on manipulating these people and then he he sees that and he just plays her. Yeah. Um, In fact, I mean, we we learn that she came from the place that he's going, right? She Mm -hmm. came from the Southeast. She came from across the desert. So there's this really interesting mystery around around that, right? Like that's where the man in black is going. That's where he's chasing him. And that's where she came from. Yeah. It's full of these, you know, potentially full of these uh, extremely evil people. Yeah. 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 Um, 
yeah so uh, this all kind of leaves me wondering if the man in black is literally satan or or whatever is equivalent to that in in king's world yeah and i think i think that's kind of that's kind of where the book wants you right now Mm -hmm. wondering that so perfect uh roland stops by the livery on his way out and, and and prepares to leave and it's 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 wonderfully atmospheric because like a dust storm is literally brewing like we can kind of see the climax of his time in Tull coming to a head and like kennerly and his kids try to stop him and fail um and and once again we get this like <laughs> this moment where he writes uh, one of Kennerly's kids and says the girl looked at him bovinely her breasts thrust with overripe grandeur at the wash faded shirt she wore one thumb sought the haven of her mouth with dreamlike slowness so I mean I, I like we've been talking about like sex and and the, a while but we haven't really talked about just the way King sometimes writes women um, and I think it's important that we we talk about it but I think it's important we talk about it in context Sure. Um, I mean, like to me, this paragraph that you just just pulled out, um, I read as more like this is how Roland sees this woman, um, Mm -hmm. not this is how King (laughs) sees this woman necessarily. Sure. Um, Like Roland is this perhaps old, crusty guy from a fantasy universe. (laughs) So it kind of scans that he would see women that way. Um, Like I I thought Alice's inner life felt like perfectly real and vivid human psychology. So. So clearly King is capable of giving a, a woman, a, 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 you know, a, a real full uh, inner, inner life and and full characterization. Um, I don't I don't know what to make of it, really. I mean, it's I, I, I get that I get that maybe this is this is literally just King being a bit sexist <laughs> in 1982. Um, but and I don't really have any strong desire to, like, defend it either. It's just. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's just. Neither do I want to come down on him for something where he could just be saying this is how this character is. Yeah. And I, I think there there is a re- like these these characters have always been described by the story as barely human almost. Like yeah. they're, they're they're kind of just monstrous generally. And I think like the, like Bavinely is like it's not like it's not like Roland or King through Roland is looking at just like this innocent woman who has done nothing wrong. And we're animalizing like we're, we're, we're making her into an animal. These people are essentially at, especially at this point in the story, animals, like they're about to go mad and, and try and just like turn into this mob that's trying to kill him. Right. So yeah, I I just like, I don't, I don't want to shy away from this and I don't want to defend it either, but I also don't want to spend like, I don't want this to be a show where we're tackling like King's sexism, like obvious or latent um in in the story like i don't want that to be this podcast but i also don't want to not acknowledge it you know what i mean so yeah here in the first episode king does have trouble writing women sometimes he appears on that subreddit men writing women a lot um i don't particularly like that place because they mostly take that stuff out of context but this is the this is the truth this is the truth to his writing and we need to acknowledge it yeah i mean it strikes me that like men like can't there's men writing women mistakes and then there's men writing men looking at women. Sure. Sure. And men are, you know, terrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so King writing men looking at women and it, and it sounding this way, uh, that it's just, it's just, it's just the way Roland is, you know, sure. <laughs> which yeah. is not great. So there, there is, there is an argument to be said if that's, if all your characters are like that, it starts saying something about fair, you. Fair. Um, but I also think, king is trying to explore terrible people like yeah that. and i don't think roland's a terrible person let, 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 let's i i love roland as a character he's fascinating he is definitely not like a, a horrible person in this way but um he definitely sees women especially certain women in the story in a very particular yeah. light um, well like you said a second ago it kind of seems like in the same way that this that the world has moved on like this town has been chewed as it were yeah. all yeah. these people are also sort of like um shadows of human beings like yeah. like 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 the the first thing that happens when he gets into town is like he asks a question of these boys and they just ignore him completely and then one of them answers the question and then he hears them get like physically assaulted as he walks away just for yeah. answering his question like these are yeah. these are broken like remnants of of people and so mm-hmm. in that context that line reads a little bit more like yeah he's just correctly assessing the level to which they've sunk 
Sure, sure. Yeah, I think that's the best way of saying it. So cool. All right. So as Roland prepares to leave the town, the trap is finally sprung. Allie bursts out of a building, followed by Sheb and the entirety of Tull. She's being held hostage, but she said the word, Matt. She said 19. She knows what lies beyond death, and she begs Roland to end her life, and he gladly obliges. And then we move into our first action scene. Yeah, um, a, a, a really touching, sad moment. Um, it I, is. It really I was surprised is. that it kind of kind of resolved as quickly as it did and as, as decisively as it did. And I was sad for Allie. Yeah. So um, there's a couple things I, I want to talk about here. The first one is is that fact that we, we talked about earlier. We've been calling this guy Roland since the show started. But this is the moment where we get his name as Allie begs him to take her life that's when she says his name for the first time. And this is obviously a very deliberate choice on behalf of King. And I want us to explore it for a little bit. Yeah. I I love the crap out of this um, because for one thing, it makes the moment hit harder than it already would have Uh, the moment when he has to gun down a woman who he obviously has some fondness for is the moment that he gets his name. Yeah. And it forces us to identify Roland as Roland is the guy who's forced to kill people. He loves, um, Mm -hmm. I, and I also I feel like um, he probably only gives his name to people that he likes in the first place. So, yeah, just by definition of the fact that she knows his name, um, it makes it more tragic that he has the killer. Yeah. And I like that King doesn't really cheat with this either. Like, it's not like he went out of his way to avoid like having Roland say his name at any point. It's mm-hmm. just like it just seems so casually done. Right. In fact, I did not recognize it until like I read this book th- four times. I did not catch it until you pointed it out and you pointed it out to me and I opened up the the document and did a control F for Roland and I was like, oh, fuck, he's right. <laughs> like, so I, it's it's done so subtly that I honestly didn't notice. Yeah. And and like you're not really paying attention to it either, right? Like sure. you're, you, you were kind of wondering what his name was maybe, but I feel like by page 70 or whatever, you stop actively mm-hmm. looking for that information. Sure. Yeah. Um, and now you know it and you don't remember why you know it necessarily. And that's a cool trick, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about, though, is one of those rare instances where we can actually discuss the differences between the originally published version of this book and the revised version. Most of those differences we were never going to be able to talk about until maybe like the very end of this whole thing, like on our final episode, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, because they're they're they have to do with how King is like kind of changing and reorienting the story. But This is one that I think I can I'm pretty comfortable that we can tell in the original version of this book. Allie did not beg Roland to kill her. Um, She was used as a home human shield and Roland just kind of very coldly and efficiently shot her and killed her because all these people were coming after him and she was in the way. And I think King decided after the fact that Roland was probably that was probably like too much for Roland. And and he changed it. This is basically his Han shot first change, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and I hated it in Star Wars. Like that's stupid. But I like it here. And, and I want to I want to circle back to our Roland conversation that we've been having a, a few times again because here we are at the end of the chapter. Roland is going to brutally destroy each and every member of Tull, and he does it with this kind of detached efficiency. He kills men, women, and children. Like there's a line where like a kid stabs him in the butt with a fork, and he just blows his head off. Yeah. And and. But but he's not a monster like he does care about these things. And I think I think having him like grant Ali a mercy instead of a cold blooded killing being as if it's been established that she's really the only good person in this entire town. Yeah, I think it was really important to establish him as cold, efficient, going to definitely kill you, going to going to if you've got a demon inside you going to stick a gun up in you casually and not care. But he's not a monster. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like the the book is sort of established. These people are, if not literally zombies, on their way there, and and you, you I mean, I think it's all a matter of like, what do you feel? Like you mm-hmm. feel sad that he kills Allie, but not because you're disappointed in him, more that it's just tragic that it had to happen, but you believe that it did have to happen. And then when he murders everybody else in the town, you're all, I mean, you're basically like good riddance. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's the mindset King has put you in. And it's, it's kind of, it's one of those things where you're like uncomfortable to admit that, but like, he's totally, he's totally got you in this headspace where you're like, blow the town away. It's horrible. They're all horrible. This place has been touched by this 
devil and it's it's is ruined now and this is almost a mercy he's almost performing a mercy on the whole town yeah yeah um, at least the text kind of frames it he's, that way yeah. he's cleansing it he's yeah cleansing the town yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah sorry go ahead yeah, i was just gonna say i think i think if roland had just killed her in cold blood i i would um walk back a lot of my sense that he's this sensitive soul that life is just ground down and i would it, it would make him a lot less compelling of a character to me um it would kind of kill what i see as the mystery this this question at the heart of this character of like okay well, why is he this way how did he become this way and, and what is mm -hmm. kind of underneath all of this so i'm glad that king made this change actually yeah yeah and i th I think it's gonna pay off even more going and without spoiling too much it's gonna it's gonna matter more going into the future i think as well yeah so okay. Uh, so this is the first action sequence in the book, and I kind of want to just get your uh, opinion on it. I, I really like the way King writes action. I think it's very kinetic. Um, it's always very clear to me. We get like we don't get a lot of gunslinging in here. We like Roland describes his reloading method as like a trick, like he's super fast at doing it um, and super efficient. And I think he only misses like once, but it's like because he gets hit with something yeah but he also like he's also not like a superhero right because he gets stabbed he gets beaten like an entire town is chasing after him and he wins because he's roland but he doesn't come out of it unscathed either it seems like nobody else has guns is one yes. one reason why it doesn't at any point feel weird um that like he has these six shooters he's a crack shot he has a lot of bullets and he can reload fast that's kind of mm -hmm. all you would need um to to win this fight um and, and yeah it, it kind of makes sense that uh, like like you said he's not a superhero he doesn't literally kill everyone without without a single scratch um and and that that also establishes like he's not supernatural or if he is supernatural it's, it's in a very subtle way right and that's something that i think is still something that that you know we we need to learn at this point in the story so yeah, yeah. the man in black is a sorcerer he is not at seemingly at least yeah um, yeah yeah um and I think you're you're bright about the guns. I think it specifically says that most of the people in town probably have never seen a gun before. Mm -hmm. So I think that that adds to the mystical gunslinger thing and that like nobody here has guns. Yeah. It's like he's the only gunslinger it says in this chapter left. He's yeah. the only gunslinger left. And therefore, these could be the only two guns left in the entire world. Um, yeah, it's, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, it, it, it prompts all sorts of questions. Sure, um, sure. Yeah. So cool. once all of Tull is dead, Roland finds good old Nort crucified on top of Shebs. Um, he has the mark of a large and purple cloven, cloven hoof pressed into the skin of his forehead. I just love that imagery. Like he's he's like hanging up on the top of Shebs. He's been crucified and he's got a, a, cl a cloven hoof, kind of the sign of the devil. Yeah. Uh, like stamped into his forehead. Um. And Roland takes him down and puts him with the rest of the people. And that, like, what do you think of the fact that like he kills this entire town and then he like goes and eats and he spends the night there and then leaves in the morning? Um, what do you think about that? I mean, it's a sign of his sort of pragmatism, right? Yeah. Like, like yeah. on some level, maybe it bothers him, but he's not really in touch with himself enough to uh understand that like i i think the i think basically he doesn't process the grief or the or the pain or the trauma of what mm -hmm. he's just had to do until he until he tells the story to brown and at this point he's just kind of mechanically seeing to his human needs and preparing to continue his pursuit of the man in black yeah yeah i like i liked the part where it, it pointed out uh he spent one last night in the bed he had shared with Allie. i yeah. think there's there's some there's some tragedy to that and almost some like longing in yeah. role. Like the town is empty. He could have slept anywhere. He chose to sleep in that bed one last time with the person that uh, not with the person, but, but w in the bed that he shared with that person yeah. that he was forced to kill. Right. With, you know, the smells and, and the associated comfort, he can maybe even lie to himself and pretend that she's still there. And yeah. And, and the text doesn't say that that's what happened, but the text is being extremely sparse with these kinds of details at this point. So you can kind of assume that, yeah that i mean he has to lie in that bed for a while before he falls asleep what is he thinking about as that happens sure stuff like this yeah yeah i like that a lot so roland finishes his tale at last and now we're back one flashback deep back with brown and brown says there you've told it do you feel better the gunslinger started why would i feel bad 
you're human, you said. No demon. Or did you lie? And he says, no lie. Um, I, I, that's really powerful. Like, did you feel better? Mm-hmm. And he, I, my interpretation of this, and you have to tell me what you thought, like, he's feigning like he doesn't feel bad. Like, he, it's, it's an act that he's putting on for this guy. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I'm torn between he's just pretending consciously or he's pretending subconsciously or in other words he's in denial yeah um or 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 uh or not in touch with his emotions would be a better way of putting that yeah sure sure i'm not sure though i think i think it's just he's on this quest if we want to call it that and um yeah he's gonna he's as ka wills it right he's gonna do what he's gonna do and i think i think i don't know if we see him say that specifically but like it was Ka's will to kill all these people, so he's gonna do it. Yeah, it's sort of like if, if you know, if you knew, if you knew factually that a town was infested by satanic monsters, and you had to blow them all away, you would like sort of know intellectually that you had done a good thing. <laughs> sure. But, but at the same time, like that's not the way humans work. We, yeah, we. It, it would be horrible to have to do that. In fact. That's exactly the kind of thing that Satan would do is put you through an experience that would scar and traumatize you, even if you were doing the right thing in doing so. Yeah. And that's that's actually what I want to talk to you about, Okay, because I want to like, is the man in black's trap here? Was he trying to kill Roland or was he just playing with him, you know, putting him through this thing, forcing him to kill these people? Because like like you said, he's got two guns none of these people have guns there's probably very few situations in which he doesn't get out of this alive um and i just wanted to put that in your mind maybe i'm being simplistic but like i feel like the man in black could easily kill him by just like poisoning some of the jerky he leaves in the fire when he continues walking sure (laughs) like like like, uh, killing killing him seems like it would be really easy for somebody as powerful as this guy seems to be yeah he was in this town for six days right he was sleeping at night you could have just had someone i mean one person tried but it was like at the worst possible time because he's wide awake and about to bang right he's like i I agree with you yeah yeah there's so many and there's so many ways to kill a person that are not a direct attack Sure. Um, especially for somebody who uh, literally is magic like like we don't know the magic system maybe roland has some kind of protection or what have you but but i think the simpler explanation at this point to my mind is just the man in black really doesn't want to kill him he wants to break him mm-hmm. okay cool um and, and the last thing i want to mention before we wrap everything up is one of the interesting parts that we kind of talked about is how the beats of this chapter kind of rhyme with each other. We get that story about Roland entering Tull. Then we got the story about man black entering Tull. But there's also this moment that I, I noticed when I reread it again, right before the show that Allie finishes her story about the man in black. And there's this long silence and, and it goes on for so long that she begins to think Roland fell asleep during the story. And then at last he talks to her. Mm-hmm. And then as he finishes up this story, the same thing happens here. He, he finishes up and there's this super long silence and Roland kind of thinks to himself, did, did he fall asleep? And then Brown talks and then he says, there, you've told it. Do you feel better? And I just think that's really interesting, right? Like we, we, the, whenever we start seeing patterns and stuff, um, is it just, this is just like a, a proclivity of the author or is this an intentional rhyming here? Yeah. I mean, I, I, now that you've drawn attention to it, I feel like it, it it's intentional. And um, the only thing I can think of by way of explanation is like these people are waiting to be sure the story is over. Yeah. Um, if, if we're introducing supernatural elements and if a story has some kind of supernatural power to it, then mm-hmm. then maybe it would be it would be bad to interrupt a story. And so you want to be really sure the story is over before it's done. Sure. S- something along these lines. I also think there's something to this idea that like these stories are confessions. Mm-hmm. I think Allie's story to Roland is kind of a confession of this horrible thing she witnessed and sharing this knowledge that she's going to be tempted with. Roland's story to Brown is is a sort of confession as well. Mm-hmm. And when you finish your story, like w- w- if you're confessing to a priest you want to be absolved, right? You, you want, you want them to say something to you. And so there's this moment of anxiety at the end of the story before they're saying anything back. You want like, it's okay. It's okay. Like yeah. it's going to be okay. And, and not, and they're delayed that in both instances and it's torturous for them. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. This idea that, that maybe 
the reason why a person is telling a story is to get a certain reaction. And when mm-hmm. that reaction is denied, they, they feel, they feel anxious. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Like imagine if, if we're reading this book and King's reading this book aloud to you and he finishes and you just don't say anything for like <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. All right. So in the end, Roland decides that Brown is not some trick of the man in black, or at least even if he is, he's not going to do anything about it. And he allows him to live He sets off from Brown's homestead and we finally, at the end of the chapter, get back to the present as Roland awakes from the dream around the fire. And as he awakes, he's thinking about how he no longer feels guilt for what he did at all. Uh, He just he's just thinking of Susan. He's thinking of Mihis. He's thinking of Court, who he describes as the man who taught him to shoot and how that man knew right from wrong, whereas he's not sure if he does anymore. And we close the chapter on Court was dead. They were all dead, except for him. The world had moved on. And then so does Roland. He gets up and and walks forward further into the desert. It's great. Uh, Before we move on from just that last bit, another thing that reminds uh, me of Tom Bombadil is that the man in black seems to be able to do pretty much whatever he wants, but he doesn't mess with Brown. Yeah. Um, So Brown must be special. In my yeah, mind. wouldn't it wouldn't it be uh, wouldn't it be advantageous to to screw with him via Brown? I yeah, think it would totally. And he doesn't. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Tom Bombadil being sort of like arbitrarily immune to whatever, but yeah, I, I love this so much. I never, I never thought about the Tom Bombadil thing, but I, I like that so much. It, and it's such, it's such a king version of that, right? Like yeah. instead of this jolly giant guy, it's this kind of long strawberry blonde long haired like i think it's like his, his strawberry hair that almost goes to his waist yeah um, so he's got this long hair and he's just this like he's not as old as you think he would be and he's just like picking corn with this weird animal friend yeah it, yeah it's totally he's, just stephen king's tom bombadil yeah, he's got an animal companion he's got a spring uh tom bombadil like had a a, a, a um like a river nymph that lived with him yeah um i love it yeah that that's what i mean you, you said he wanted to write lord of the rings <laughs> there it. we go yeah there we go yeah so what i i think it's really important that, that we close this chapter once again thinking about the past we have we're name dropped again we have susan we have me uh these are places we know nothing about we get a little bit of information about who this court person is this is not the first time he's mentioned court he mentioned it early in the chapter as well but we get him as the man who taught roland how to shoot which uh in the world of gunslinging it seems like the person that tells you how to shoot is pretty important Absolutely. Can't wait to find out more about that. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, him questioning whether or not he feels guilt anymore is like, I think a a, a non monstrous person would do that, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you were truly monstrous, you wouldn't be questioning it and you wouldn't be thinking about this person from your past that would have would have been a better person than you. Like just the fact that you're thinking about that hints towards some like, compassion guilt is complicated too i I, i'm i i fully believe that a person can believe that they don't have any guilt and then actually still have guilt like it's it's a it's a complicated thing there there are there is the guilt that you admit to yourself and the guilt that you just carry um as part of you unconsciously so yeah we'll see i i i I don't know i feel like guilt in the past are like going to be major major themes of this book so i think you're right um, cool, and that's not me spoiling anything. I just think I just think they're important <laughs> yeah. things. You yeah. you would have also thought that at this point on your first read, probably. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Matt. So we've kind of already done some of this, but we're going to move into the speculation corner. When okay. it was my corner, I called it Spot Scott Speculations, which was, was alliterative and great. So I don't know what you want to call it, Matt. Yeah, we'll we'll figure something out. Matt's musings. M- musings. Matt's. Um, I don't know. I don't, my, my vocabulary flees me right now. Alliteration is very important. So it, it is. has, it ha, we need it. We, we need do. It. Yeah. Please email us, uh, <laughs> doofmedia at gmail.com with, with the name of the Matt's musing section. All right. I, I only have, I mean, I have two simple little ones, which are almost, well, okay. The, the second one is super obvious. The first one is just that I think like, uh, uh, Roland walking across the desert is, is sort of chronologically toward the end of the story and much of the story will be told in flashbacks. Okay. And number two is that we're going to learn the story of Susan Cord and Mihis and all these other words and names and places that, that we've heard about. Like we're going to get, we're going to get a story about that. It's not just, it's not always going to be just a mystery. 
that's okay. my two that's my two speculations cool i like those speculations we will see in the coming weeks whether you're right or wrong okay all right um so in our other shows and we're still kind of working on the format of the show so please give us a few weeks as we kind of nail it down i don't know if we want to do like a traditional discussion question matt but i, I do want to reach out to the audience the people that are listening to this and i want to know what you guys thought like if you've read this book for the first time uh what did you think of chapter one what did you think of the first chapter this is chapter one of book one of a long long series what did you think did you like it as much as matt were you a little disappointed um and if you've read the dark tower series before if you are an expert without spoiling it why do you like it so much i want to hear that no spoilers i won't read them i won't read them out loud so um how should they contact us matt i didn't think about that via email right yeah <laughs> via email doofmedia at gmail.com we'll use there that we one yep, yeah let's do that one okay. yeah all right cool. all right um well that's it for us here at Kingslingers, we'll be back next week with a brand new episode covering two chapters next week. The chapter is a little bit shorter. We'll be covering chapter two, the way station and chapter three, the Oracle and the mountains. Cool. Um, yeah. Remember you can reach out to us via email at Kingslinger pod at gmail.com or on Twitter at doof media. Yeah. We said doof media.com. I actually think it's Kingslingers pod at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, Kingslingers pod at gmail.com. You know what? first it'll episode in, we're gonna sort all this out it'll be in the show notes it'll yeah. be in the show notes sounds fun. good um and if you're not already subscribed to kingslingers now is the time to do it folks um make sure you never miss an episode we're on basically every single podcast platform itunes stitcher spotify youtube google play everywhere that you can subscribe to podcasts we are there um and you should subscribe so you don't have to worry about when's the next episode come out i don't know it'll just hit your your podcast app and then you just press play it's easy yeah that's how we do things these days yeah and as always you can find this and all the other shows we do uh, if this is your first doof media show we do a ton of content uh, every week we have something exploring some new piece of media whether it be an online web serial like worm or ward if you've ever heard about those stories um just generally talking about sometimes people make me watch anime um sometimes we just talk about movies we have a whole series called deconstructing directors when we look dive into some some film directors uh we're talking about david fincher right now um tons of stuff tons of shows you can find out all the information at that at doofmedia.com yeah tons of shows and they're all great they are and if you like any of our shows and you want to support them consider donating to our patreon at patreon.com slash doof media you can donate a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford supporting us on patreon gives you tons of great bonuses like voting in our quarterly fan art and uh, Halloween costume contests for the parahuman stories, hangout yeah. sessions with the doof crew and access to live streams of our recording sessions. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, not all the time. Sometimes, sometimes. And yeah. of course the excellent discord channel where people uh, chat about books, movies and all this other cool stuff. Yeah, we are entirely patron funded. So each and every dollar that our patrons donate to us uh, goes right back into this company and allows us to put on these shows we do. Um, so we appreciate everyone that that gives gives money and supports us. Uh, we really appreciate that. And there's another way to support us. And this is big, Matt. This is the most important thing we're going to ask our listeners to do this week. One of the biggest metrics for success for a new podcast is how many ratings and reviews you get coming right out the gate. Um, the most important time in a podcast's life is like the first three weeks that it's on any of these platforms. So listeners, we need your help. If you enjoyed this episode, please go right now to Apple Podcasts, to Spotify, to Stitcher, or wherever you're listening that has its own voting metric thing. Hit that five-star button and write us a review. It honestly makes a huge, huge, huge difference. And that's the most help you can be right now. Because if, if we get a lot like a lot of very quick five star ratings and reviews, um, we kind of move up some lists. People find us. We'll be at the t if someone searches for Dark Tower in a podcatcher, it'll be the first one that comes up. It's just really key to us finding an audience. And uh, and we really, really appreciate that help. Yeah, this is this is probably the most important ask that we're ever going to make of you on this show. So, yes. So yes. please. Yes. Yes. All right, folks, we will see you back here next week for chapters two and three of The Gunslinger. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. <laughs> <laughs>